Right, so it, it is noon, so I want to welcome everyone to, um, to our session on, uh, on uh, dispersal and related topics. Uh, my name is Jeanette Witten, uh, and I'm going to be the moderator, and so my job is simple. I just introduce you, and then I keep time, and I will give you a, a four-minute warning. It might be useful for speakers to have a way of noticing that I'm over here muted in the corner doing, doing um, four fingers. I'll put it also in the chat, but as we, we just said, don't watch the chat, so, so maybe that's contradictory, but in case you're not listening to the suggestion. <laughs> You can, uh, I'll put it in there as well. And then at one minute, I'll, I'll really start to kind of um, climb around your screen as much as I can. Um, and we're going to try to keep time so people can move between sessions. So um, unless there are any quick questions right now about the mechanics of that, uh, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, uh, Brandy uh, Quarles. I'm, you'll, I'm, forgive me if I'm not pronouncing your last name right, is going to speak to us about demographic and evolutionary consequences of spatial dispersal. Take it away. Okay, sorry, I was muted. Um, thank you, Jeanette, for introducing me. Um, as she said, I'm going to be talking to you about dispersal and potential colonization success in an annual plant. So spatial dispersal in plants can occur either through pollen or through seeds, and seeds can disperse through various mechanisms such as the wind, by animals, etc. Um, the case I'm going to be talking to you about today is primarily wind dispersal, but understanding and investigating dispersal is important because it can give us insights into species invasions, range expansions or shifts, response to habitat fragmentation, and environmental tracking in the face of climate change. In fact, as the climates have already started to shift, so have species ranges. Um, so here in this figure on the right, I'm showing how uh, some tree species in North America have already started to shift their peak abundances. But just moving to a new place is not sufficient. You also have to survive and reproduce in the new location. And so some key aspects of post-dispersal are the quantity of dispersers and the genetic and phenotypic composition of dispersed individuals. So the quantity of dispersers is going to influence the population size and then um, influence the strength of genetic drift and demographic stochasticity. So here in this top example, I'm showing you a source population that has um, a good size population size is denoted by the rectangle and it has um, a good starting mix of genetic variation is denoted by the different colors of the circles. And then after dispersal, for example, if you get a small population, then um, genetic drift may be really strong and you just may lose some of that genetic variation by chance. For the genetic and phenotypic composition of dispersed individuals, that's going to influence the potential for selection and the rate and level of adaptation. So in this example, I'm showing you a source, same source population, but then dispersal is biased in this case. So the purple individuals are able to disperse better than the others. And then just this first step of dispersal, we've lost one of our genotypes just because it wasn't as able to disperse as far. So what happens next? That depends on the environment. So if red is favored post-dispersal, it's not in the post-dispersal environment and we may have population decline because of that. If blue is favored post-dispersal, we have very low starting allele frequencies. So we have, may have a slow response to selection in the new environment. If purple is favored, that'd be advantageous because we have lots of purple in this new environment and we can actually get population growth. And this could spur future population spread because we're essentially spatially sorting out the good dispersers. The good dispersers are making it farther and they're growing well in the post-dispersal environment. So I wanted to investigate both of those aspects of post-dispersal success. So in part one today, I'm gonna to talk about quantifying and characterizing dispersed individuals. And in part two, I'm going to talk about population consequences of spatial dispersal, in which I compare populations open to dispersal and populations closed to dispersal. So for the first part, my specific questions are how many individuals disperse to different distances, because that's going to determine the population sizes post dispersal. Are dispersed individuals a non random subset of source populations? with respect to phenotypes. So for example, if tall individuals are able to disperse their seeds farther, with respect to fitness, are the individuals that are making the most seeds in the source environment, the ones dispersing the most and the farthest? And with respect to genotypes, so this is going to connect to, is 
their potential for indirect selection and, and what are the consequences on genetic variation. For part two, I'm asking, is there lower between year fluctuations in population size and open compared to cage? Is there higher population size and open compared to cage after three years? So these two questions are getting at, is um, just being open to dispersal also like supplementing your population size? And then is there less variation among populations in open compared to cage after three years? So is dispersal between nearby populations reducing that between population variation? And then if we do find those differences in population size or variation, does that also lead to more successful local adaptation and the population is open to dispersal compared to closed? To answer these questions, I'm using the research system Arabidopsis taliana. It's an annual plant with a plethora of genetic resources information. It's primarily wind dispersed, capable of rapid adaptation, and it has a wide geographic distribution. And that suggests that it's capable of dispersal and it's short-lived, which makes it easy to do um, short experiments. For my source populations, I'm using um, a global evolution experiment that the lab is part of. It's called Genomics of Rapid Evolution in Novel Environments, or GreenNet. The goal of the global experiment is to identify genetic loci associated with local adaptation across the native and introduced geographic range of this plant. And each site started with the same starting mix of native ecotypes, about 231 ecotypes. So um, good starting mix of genetic variation. And we every site flowered, sampled flowers each year for pull sequencing. So we can follow changes in allele frequencies. And then in between these source populations or these experimental populations for the global experiment, I put dispersal populations at different distances. So basically just trays with soil, then nothing else to catch dispersed seeds. So I had close ones that were 0.24 meters away from a source tray, middle ones 1.07 meters away from a source, and then far trays that were about two and a half meters away from a source tray. And then I let them sit out there for one dispersal season. And then I brought them into the greenhouse and I sampled soil at different depths so I could try to get as many seeds that dispersed into those trays as possible. And then I gave them ideal germination conditions to get maximum germination. And this uh, schematic is represented four times in the field. Okay, so what about the results? How many individuals disperse to different distances? So this first graph, I'm showing you the estimated number of seeds that disperse to a given distance based off of the area that I actually sampled with my trays. And so this is average number of plants, and this is close versus far. I'm only showing close and far on the results because the middle trays were not very different from close or far trays. And you can see that the close trays had more plants than the far trays. I'm also showing you average density and those um, trays. And so again, close trays had a higher density than far trays. What about our dispersed individuals, a non-random subset of source populations? We actually found that there was some bias with respect to size at reproduction. So here I'm showing you average leaf number at reproduction and then close versus far. And, I, and here we found bigger individuals dispersed farther. The caveat here is that this is only for the first half of my data, so two out of the four replicates that I had in the field. I'm still um, collecting data on the second half. Okay, so in summary of part one, we found differences in seed rate and density in that there were fewer individuals dispersing farther and we had smaller densities. We had differences in leaf number and rosette diameter reproduction in that bigger individuals disperse farther. We did not find any differences in reproductive traits, such as basal branches, primary branches, um, or fruit number. And so to kind of pull it back into the introduction, we can see that our far populations had smaller population sizes potentially, and but bigger individuals. So they are subject to drift and that you may lose some of that genetic variation due to drift, but being bigger may um, make you a better competitor or just confer higher fitness in that new post-dispersal environment, which could lead to population growth. Okay, so now getting into part two. So our, we had 12 open trays. So these are the ones that are just open to dispersal. These are also our source trays for the dispersal experiment I just talked about. We also had six cage trays. So same um, starting mix of ecotypes, just I put these cages around them as you can see in the picture to prevent any dispersal into the tray. Um, the plants could still disperse out, but just within the cage itself. 
And then this uh, schematic is represented two times in the field. Okay, to just quickly remind you of my questions for this part, I'm looking for differences in population size um, and differences in phenotypic variation among populations. So we did not see any differences in fluctuations between years in population size, but we did find differences in absolute population size in year three. So in year three, this is the number of plants on the y-axis and then open populations, the so ones that were open to dispersal versus the cage, the ones that were closed to dispersal. And you can see that the open populations had higher population sizes in year three than the caged ones did. And then for variation, we found um, both in size and reproduction traits and reproductive traits that there was less variation among populations in the open compared to the cage. So here, this is variance in leaf length and variance in leaf number. The black bars are variance between populations and the orange bars are variance within populations. And you can see that in, um, for these two cases I'm showing you here, the between population variance is higher for the caged than the open. You also notice that there are no clear differences in within population variance between the open and the caged, however. Okay, so to summarize this part, we found we did not find differences in population size fluctuations, but we did find that cage populations were smaller after three years. So dispersal allowed open populations to maintain larger population sizes. We found open populations had less between population variance, variation than cage populations, but we didn't find any clear differences in the within population variance that you would expect. And there are no differences in local adaptation after three years. So in fact, both size reproduction and fruit number declined over the three years in the field, um, and they declined about equally for the open and the closed. Okay, so to pull it all together, we found initially smaller population sizes in the far populations, but potentially higher population growth due to larger plants in those. We found larger population sizes and less between population variants in populations that were open to immigration. And so here I'm just showing you that in the isolated populations, or in our case, the caged populations, there's lots of between population variation and these populations were smaller. And then to pull those together into future potential implications, um, it's possible that far populations are gonna be more isolated just by a function of distance. And so after dispersal, we could have far isolated populations that have, um, that are smaller population sizes, but also have those bigger individuals, which could lead to initial population growth, which have before um, with genetic drift first. And then if selection all of a sudden um, disfavors red, so we have some type of environmental change, then we could have population decline um, and no potential for rescue from any dispersal from nearby populations. On the other hand, for the close populations, um, which we expect to be more open to, to dispersal, they could sustain themselves because they have good sized populations and good genetic variation. But if the environment changes and all of a sudden red is disfavored, for example, we could have slow selection due to dispersal because we're getting those red um, still coming in from dispersal from nearby populations. Okay, so for future directions, I plan on measuring traits of dispersed plants in high versus low density. Um, this will get into plasticity to see if the traits that are related to dispersal only develop in high density, for example, and then if we're dispersing into low densities, that can have implications for future spread. Do different genotypes disperse more than others? So I still need to look at the genetics and do, I'm planning to do pool sequencing for source and bar trays to compare little frequencies, and then also individual level sequencing to look at which ecotypes are dispersing farther. And then for part two, does genetic variation differ between open versus cage populations? So looking at pool sequencing and comparing allele frequencies between those two. And then lastly, it would be interesting to see if um, with more time, what differences in population variant, within population variants develop. With that, I would like to thank my lab, Green Net coordinators, my amazing undergraduates, my committee, the Greenhouse Biotron, uh, a small grant from Duke Biology that gave me the money to do this um, work, NSF GRFP, and then ASN and BSA grants for other research projects that I'm doing. That's it. Great, thank you, Brandy. Um, if anyone has any questions for Brandy, please drop them in the chat or in the Slack. Um, 
I can start off the questions. So really cool talk. Thank you. Um, I'm intrigued by your sort of initial results about having larger plant sizes for the farther dispersers. Do you have any speculation maybe about why that is happening um, since the, you know, in plants, the dispersal phase is not necessarily linked to vegetative plant size. So do you think that's because they're larger plants can produce more seeds and have more chance to go farther or do you have any thoughts about what's going on there? Yeah, I, um, my initial thought would be to think that bigger um, plants can make more seeds that could disperse more, um, but we didn't see differences in um, fruit number in the greenhouse, but it could be just because I was measuring in the greenhouse and not in the environment that the plants actually disperse from. Any other questions for Brandy? Okay, um, we have one from Nick. Um, in reducing dispersal with the cages, you are also increasing local retention of seeds. Does that change any of your interpretations? Um, so the seeds, so my cages were um, a little bit bigger than the trays themselves. So the seeds could still get out of the trays that I was actually measuring plants in. Um, so, and any seeds that disperse within the cage, I just ignored basically, so. Do we have any other questions? Okay, a couple coming in now. Um, so let's see, it seems that in the far trays, you had less plants, but bigger plants. Um, do you have any thoughts about the effects of density or how to potentially disentangle that? Oh, that's a good question. So I forgot to mention that I grew all of the dispersed plants and they're the same density. So uh, they all grew in like little plug trays. So I had low density for this. That's part of the reason why I want to do the density manipulation where I can grow them at high versus low. Um, and what about plasticity? Could you elaborate more on that? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I was really shocked that I didn't find any reproductive traits that were correlated to dispersal in this. Um, and some previous experiments have found that traits like height um, are only correlated to dispersal under high densities. Um, so that is part of the reason why I'm interested in that. And then, like I said, if, for example, you, you see the scenario where there are certain traits that confer higher dispersal, um, but they those traits only develop in their high density and then you're dispersing into low densities, then you're kind of taking away your dispersal increasing trait as you disperse. Yeah, that's a super interesting dynamic. Um, okay, I will just check the Slack. It seems like people are not over there as much. Um, yeah, any last questions for Brandy before we move on to the next speaker? Okay, one last one um, from Bo Jang. Do you see any differences in the fitness in terms of things like growth rate or height of the dispersed individuals in the new trays? Um, no, so the fitness, at least in the greenhouse, seemed to be the same between the far trays um, and the close trays. Um, and the fitness in the source trays were, was pretty high as well. Okay, um, thanks for that great presentation and all your answers. I think we can now hand it back over to Jeanette to introduce the next speaker. Uh, um, thanks so much, Brandy, for getting us off to a rip-roaring start there, terrific. Um, our next speaker is Taylor Zalek. And um, before I introduce uh, Taylor, I just wanted to remind everyone that as we're getting going, since there's a half a minute here, um, that we um, are not just abiding by our code of conduct here, but that we actually um, uh, 
want to adopt this as our as our sort of uh, central ethic for the for the conference in general. And so um, please know that your questions uh, are are fully welcome. Um, that you're if you're coming from a different subdiscipline, if this is your first conference. It, we're, we welcome your questions and um, that as speakers, we support you in presenting your work. We're here to share enthusiasm for uh, the work that we all um, are so passionate about. And so uh, please know that, you're, that um, you are all welcome in this space. Um, so with that, I'll pass it on to Taylor, who is going to answer for us the question, does evolution to novel abiotic environments by invader populations predict future invasion success. Fantastic. Can everybody hear me? Can I get a thumbs up or two? Awesome. Thank you. Jeanette, thank you for the introduction. I was really hoping um, you were going to introduce me with that bass guitar in the background that I was going to get like some kind of, you know, play in here. But um, Anyway, we were talking before everyone joined that um, we were all enjoying a little bit of sun. I have to say that here in Pittsburgh, this is like the one sunny day in the last four months. So this is good. Probably not as sunny as California is right now, but I'll take what I can get. Um, they don't tell you that before you go to grad school here that Pittsburgh has fewer sunny days than uh, Seattle. So it's, it's, it's quite cloudy all the time. But yes, I'm really excited. I don't know if I can conclusively answer this, but I'm excited to address this question. What does evolution to novel abiotic environments by experimental invasive populations predict invasion success? Um, so invasion success, what drives it is this question that has fascinated researchers for generations and continues to do so to this day. Now, there are many theories, hypotheses as to what could drive invasion success. Some of those revolve around uh, the traits of invasive species and their populations. Um, so this is more at the indiv individual or population level. Oh, Maria, hey. <laughs> and, and links also to, uh, so for instance, things like just their dispersal ability, high fecundity, growth rates, uh, those sorts of things. Other people are like, uh, not so fast. There could also be things about the environment that promote invasion. So environments that are prone to disturbance, higher changing resource availability, things that shift competition dynamics. But really what I'm interested in is kind of merging the two together to get sort of how do evolutionary components interact with the environment to uh, promote or hinder invasion success. Um, now there's good theory to suggest that evolution could and should be significant during invasion. Um, so for instance, many papers have been published about uh, theory regarding disturbance and, and disturbances is selecting for traits that promote invasions and colonization. Um, there's good e empirical evidence to support this too, particularly from microorganism studies. Um, and, but really what's, what's, what's kind of missing at this point is, is to take this really cool work that's being done in the lab and apply it to a more macro, more diverse, um, community uh, that, that can occur with uh, some of those aspects of nature that make things a little, maybe a little more realistic, maybe a little more applicable to other systems. Um, and so to do that, I've adopted duckweed as a model system for studying experimental invasions. Um, duckweed are small floating aquatic plants, They're kind of like little tiny detached lily pads. You can see my focal uh, species up here on the right, they are called lemna minor. They're like little green globules. Each one of those is a, fir we call them fronds, they're like little leaves. Um, but each one of them is an individual with the capacity to reproduce clonally. And they do this very quickly. Duckweed have generation times of as little as three to four days. And we notice that they have genetic variation in many traits. Um, they also thrive in semi-natural semi -natural mesocosm environments, which makes them good for experiments outside of the laboratory. And important to note, while they are not invasive to Western Pennsylvania, um, they are a useful model system for um, experimentally studying invasions and allow us to do experiments outside without the fear of escape. That would be the case if we were working with an actual invasive species. So. Um, I'm, there's many factors that could be influencing the evolution of invasiveness, but really I'm going to be focusing today on disturbance. And one of the reasons disturbance was kind of 
interesting for us, uh, me particularly, um, was that here in Western Pennsylvania, we have a history of disturbed wetlands and water bodies, ponds, lakes, etc. Um, Western Pennsylvania, particularly the Pittsburgh area, its history of mining and manufacturing has led to water bodies that are really uh, not so nice. And, and while this is not a water body that I sampled personally, we have some sampled water bodies like this um, that do have duckweeds living there. So it, it's, it's really interesting. And so along with um, over 700 undergraduate students um, that participated in an authentic laboratory learning experience this past spring before COVID shut us down, um, we actually measured genetic variation. So you can see 12 different genotypes of the duckweed species alumna minor on the right um, in response to a variety of stressors or uh, metals on the bottom and as measured by their per capita exponential growth rate over a 14 day time period. And so what we see, I know this kind of looks like spaghetti, um, but what we see is that we do see differences in average response in growth rate to these different stressors. And we see genetic variation um, changes in rank order, especially. Uh, so I actually took these chemicals, put them out into the, uh, the environment in our experimental setting to try to see if any of these evolved more invasive populations of our duckweed alumna minor. Um, and because I, I, I did a lot, but I'm really only gonna focus on two parts of that experiment today. That being um, comparing how aluminum, which tends to have some really interesting results here to control. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you about kind of the questions that I was hoping to address with this experiment. The central questions were really wondering whether or not communities in stressful environments, so regardless of their, their immediate evolutionary history, become more susceptible to invasions whether or not populations evolving in stressful environments are more successful at invading communities, regardless of the invasion environment, or whether or not evolving populations become more successful at invading communities experiencing those similar environments, so a local adaptation. And to do this, I conducted a two-part field uh, mesocosm experiment, the first part being an evolution experiment. This uh, consisted of an eight-week uh, experiment uh, placing our populations of lemna minor. These are diver genotypically diverse populations. So each of those stars represents many, many, many uh, individuals and exposing them to either to, concentra uh, to aluminum or not. Uh, as a, they, in, they were initially started with the same genotypic frequencies, we expected that they evolved over time. I'm actually processing, getting that data back and hopefully processing that in the coming weeks, but I won't be able to share that with you today. This experiment was conducted at the Paimatumi Lab of Ecology. It was a mesocosm design, so everything was nested within these cattle tanks, floating rafts on insulation boards, uh, many trips to Lowe's to do this, and uh, floating little soup, one liter soup containers of duckweed nutrients and stressors. So I went up there every three days to replace the media and to add the stressor to make sure that that environment was relatively consistent over that eight week period. However, because they were outdoors, they were exposed, exposed to fluctuations in temperature, rainfall, precipitation, humidity, sunlight, um, that they might not have experienced if we had done this in a uh, laboratory setting. So this experiment lasted eight weeks. We were able to track population change over time. So here we're actually looking inside of an individual population as expressed kind of over time. Um, and, and these are being lit from the bottom. That's why they kind of look so funny, um, but we can see that they grew. And first question we want to know is, does aluminum actually disturb these populations? Like, do we see a measurable difference in terms of number of individuals over that time period? And uh, yes, we do. We see a significant difference in terms of the number of individuals evolving in these populations. So that's a good sign. We can say they're disturbed. And now we want to know, but now we got to do a couple things and then we can get to the invasion. So first we wanted to take these populations, put them into a six day common garden environment to reduce uh, maternal effects. We then uh, I created um, new containers where these populations would reciprocally invade communities. So these shapes represent diverse assemblages of other duckweed species collected from the wild. Um, experiencing aluminum stress or not. And, and 
based on this, so first let's, let's take a look at what this looked like. So here we kind of see a tangled mess of plants. Um, it, it's pretty cool. You can kind of see the limna minor. These are the focal invaders. They're in there. You, they're hard to spot, but this is at the beginning of the experiment before they really grew. Uh, but most importantly, in my mind, is that there are many species present here. So this is a really cool model system where we're able to ask questions about not just invaders, but also how do communities respond? Um, so the invasion, based on the questions and hypotheses we might form, there was, there was really three major hypotheses. The first being communities in stressful environments will be more susceptible to invasion. Again, regardless of those evolutionary histories, this is measured by uh, taking the number of invaders. So for instance, in these orange circles, which represent stressful environments, these, these populations are going to do better uh, because of that environment. Next. Uh, populations evolving in stressful environments will be more successful at invading communities. So this is regardless of that in invasion environment, that evolutionary history is gonna have more of an impact on that invasion success, number of invaders. Lastly, evolving populations more successful at invading communities experiencing similar environments. So again, local adaptation. Okay, again, I'm gonna show you a series of graphs here. I'm, a, I'm measuring invasion success is counting after initiating that invasion phase, measuring the number of invaders over an 18 day time period. And that's kind of what we're gonna test. These are all preliminary analyses, but we're gonna to try to answer a few questions here. First question being, are those communities, uh, are those stressed communities more susceptible to invasion? Uh, and the answer is, no, there's a unique dynamic going on here, but statistically, uh, based on preliminary analysis, we cannot say with confidence that aluminum um, uh, communities in, in aluminum environments are actually experiencing, uh, are, sorry, it's covered up here, more susceptible to invasion. Secondly, are populations evolving in stressful environments, more successful at invading all communities. So here, whereas the last one we were measuring the invasion environment, here we're measuring the evolution environment. So regardless of the invasion environment context, how does that history evolving in either aluminum or control conditions influence invasion success? And here we see a marginal significant, I just gotta move this thing. <laughs> we see, thank you. Okay, I see a marginal, um, significant difference between uh, those populations that evolved in aluminum conditions versus those that evolved in control conditions in terms of tracking their invasion success over that 18 day time period. That's pretty cool, that's really interesting. But what about that interaction? So here's where it gets a little more complex. We have to take into account both the evolutionary history and the immediate invasion environment. Um, are populations more successful at invading those communities experiencing similar environments? And we see that there does appear to be a significant interaction. This is really interesting. But what's doing better? Well, based on the results, what we see is that those populations evolving in aluminum tend to do a lot better when they invade aluminum environments. And they, they outperform any of the other pop These are all the same species. Um, they, they outperform uh, other populations of lemna minor invading those communities. So this is, this is really cool. And it's, it's really interesting that populations evolving in our control environment, they don't tend to do much better when they're invading those control environments. Um, but what, what could be causing this? Now, there, there could be a, many answers. Um, the most likely might be, well, maybe aluminum is just harming the community more. That's allowing for more space to invade. There's more colonization room. So the logical thing to check would be like, how is that community responding? And, and while I don't have all the answers or all the evidence yet, I do have some. So I decided that there's one more question we can ask here. Are communities in stressful environments more harmed by the presence of the stressor? And I measured this by tracking the surface area of those communities over time. Um, so here we would predict that those in aluminum conditions would actually be uh, harmed greater than those in control environments. But what we actually see is that the communities don't appear to be significantly harmed based on their um, based on their invasion environment, uh, and 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 evolution environment certainly isn't impa impacting this uh, either. It's more about the invader, I guess. But 
Anyway, so this is really interesting. And, and there's, a, there's absolutely a lot more to unpack here. There's, there's so much more to analyze. This was a large multifactorial experiment consisting of uh, hundreds, hundreds, I think, populations of evol you know, evolving populations. Um, hundreds is maybe a little much. Anyway, um, and, we're, uh, and, and, and I am in the process of quantifying evolution as measured by geno change in genotypic composition. Um, for, for a few of those, the ones that we're kind of focusing in on first are the aluminum ones. I, I have lots of data to analyze for these other stressors. How are populations responding to iron, to sodium chloride, to, um, to copper, et cetera. Um, and, and lastly, we've got a lot to do to quantify community response to these invaders. That includes biomass, more surface area analysis, biodiversity, um, et cetera. Uh, so to summarize, I want to say in, in this context, with all of those caveats of what we still have left to explore, what can we actually say um, to answer these questions, given our experiment, are communities in stressful environments more susceptible to invasion? Not supported. Um, are populations evolving in stressful environments more successful at invading communities? Marginally, uh, we're hinting at something there. Um, but interestingly, are po evolving populations more successful at invading communities experiencing similar environments to which uh, they evolved in? So that is partially support, or that is supported, and, and then it's explained by those evolving in aluminum invading aluminum. Um, so uh, there's what are potential implications of these initial preliminary results? Well, based on this, it is important to consider evolutionary history when we think about what drives invasion success. Evolutionary history is really hard to deduce when we're measuring invasion success. So what does that mean? Um, I think maybe what it means is we need to be thinking more about the future. What can we predict about invasions moving forward? Maybe we need to think about those hotspots, those environments that are a little more disturbed right now. Um, the other significant thing is to note that is there's this occurred over relatively few generations, short evolutionary time. Maybe if we had let this play out longer, we would have seen even more stronger results. Um, I, I belong to a phenomenal lab at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, supported by phenomenal PI, postdocs, undergraduate student researchers, fellow graduate students. Um, I, ca I can't thank them all by name here, but I, I, they're, they're the best. And with that, I wanna say thank you for your time. Thank you for attending. If you have questions, ask them now, drop me an email, hit me up on Twitter, do what you gotta do, but. I, I miss this about conferences is getting getting small talk. So feel free to engage and make small talk. Thank you. Great, thank you, Taylor, so much for your lovely talk. Um, people, please drop your questions for Taylor here. Okay, we have a first question from Elise. Since you didn't find an effect of aluminum on community surface area, is there any difference in community composition of the communities in aluminum? So that is a phenomenal question and one that I am in the process of answering. Most of that evidence is gonna be deduced by picking through um, photos that were, that were taken from that experiment. Um, measuring some of those species can be really challenging because some of them are slightly submerged. And, and so we can do things like maybe we can get species richness, uh, getting relative abundance might be really tricky. Um, but yes, that is something that we're really excited to find an answer to. Um, a sort of follow-up question from Maria. Um, the community data surface area was measured with or without invaders. Great question, Maria, uh, with invaders. Uh, so we were not able to take out the invaders, take the pictures, put them back in. They were, uh, invaders were present for all of the photos. Okay, um, great. We have a couple more questions coming in. I'm not sure we're gonna be able to get to all of them, but um, so one from Abdel is, do you think species that evolve in stressful environments are better invaders because they have higher intrinsic growth rate um, because the stressful environment selects for a higher growth rate or some other mechanism? Great question. So we actually tried to do a fitness test um, that was over a shorter period of time, potentially only six days. I'm not sure we captured exactly what we were looking for um, because we didn't see a big significant difference in growth, in, in, in growth rates, but we're still kind of looking at that data. We're not really sure we were a little we're, we're a little sure there might are unsure there might have been some per capita effects of aluminum stress on those individuals in large containers versus if we had done it in smaller ones. 
Um, okay, I'll try to sneak one more question in here. Um, since duckweeds are good bioremediators, do you know whether the differences in tolerance are like accumulation or just sort of tolerance in terms of resistance? Fantastic question. So we're actually trying to do a similar, uh, by the way, Dave, I don't think he knows anything about that breed, so I don't think he's asking questions like that. <laughs> I, I, um, we're actually, I just submitted a proposal last night to answer that very question. So hopefully in one year's time, uh, you will come see another talk where I'm asking that or I'm answering that question. Okay, great. Well, thanks again. Um, you can look in the chat. There's a few more questions, but we need to move on to the next talk. So let's do that. Thanks, Taylor. Um, our next speaker, moving right along, is uh, Jimena Golcher Benavides, um, who is going to address the question Does population genetic divergence predict biodiversity patterns? And off to you. Um, hello, everyone. I'm very excited. Can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I'm very excited to present today some of uh, my PhD dissertation research. So I'm Jimena. I'm a PhD candidate at University of Wyoming. And today I'm going to talk specifically on predictors of population genetic differentiation. I modified the title a little bit um, for this talk. But first, um, yeah, let me introduce some of these concepts and this idea and how um, population genetic differentiation could also have important implications in the buildup of elevation, elevated species richness in this system. But first, let's introduce the concept of genetic differentiation and specifically isolation by distance. So natural populations within a species vary in how much gene flow they experience. And perhaps the most intuitive explanation for this differentiation is isolation by distance, in which reduction in gene flow is simply driven by the geographic distance separating those populations. And uh, we can actually look at the slope of the IBD relationship and use this as a proxy that represents genetic differentiation between populations. However, when we look in nature, I'm sorry, it might be a little bit, okay. When we look in nature, we can see that it's complicated and there's a lot of variation. As evidenced by this study, the percentage of studies detecting isolation by distance or IBD patterns varies across nature uh, from 50% of the studies to 70% of the studies being able to detect IBD. So a question that arises is what drives such variation in genetic differentiation with distance? For example, IBD patterns could be driven by specific organismal traits concerning either dispersal ability. Uh, and this question has been addressed before by previous researchers in systems as varied as coral reef fishes, uh, temperate plants and Australian lizards. And identifying either uh, traits that are related to reproductive uh, features or to dispersal abilities to be very good predictors of increased genetic differentiation with distance. Moreover, if the rates of population differentiation alone were to drive the speciation rate at which these clades uh, diversify, then studying the slopes of the IBD relationships or population differentiation with distance could reveal, reveal interesting connection between microevolutionary and macroevolutionary patterns. This leads me to my study system. So Lake Tanganyika is an ideal system to examine IBD patterns due to its elevated diversity that has evolved within the lake, resulting in not only a wide variety of colors, shapes, but also ecologically distinct morphs. Moreover, due to the nature of this enormous lake, uh, the littoral represents this linear habitat that covers hundreds of kilometers and in which these, the, the bulk of the diversity of cichlids is concentrated. And it's important to notice that 
both the linear nature of this littoral shoreline of Lake Tanganyika and the fact that we have enormous variation in ecological traits spanning uh, entire positions in the food web from primary consumers to top predators makes it an ideal system to, ex to examine what drives variation in IBD patterns. But also in contrast to other freshwater fish faunas, Lake Tanganyika has attracted a large and rigorous body of literature uh, studying the systematics and the taxonomy of this cichlid fauna, dating back to the 1920s, but also being a very active field of study today as evidenced by this recent study published in 2019 by Fabrice Ronco. So having this enormous and rigorous body of literature on the taxonomic relationships and, and between cichlids, it's an important component in order to be able to ask comparative questions. At the same time, something that is unique to the system is that aquarium hobbies are obsessed with Lake Tanganyika cichlids, and they have been able not only to uh, travel extensively the lake, but to document and generate these beautiful maps where they are sharing with the community how many color variants or color morphs are found uh, throughout the shoreline that has been explored of the lake. So we can take advantage of both of, uh, the formal systematic knowledge on the system, but as well as more recent and actively documentation of the diversity of this, of this system. So now bringing back to my question in terms of, of, of can organismal traits present the opportunity to predict isolation by distance. And for this, I build ultrametric phylogenies with representatives of the different species in my data set. And I've mapped the slope of IBD as a metric of genetic differentiation as it were a trait at the tips of this ultrametric tree. And one thing that I wanted to show you here as well is that the, the cooler colors represent no pattern of isolation by distance. So at the bottom, this top predator, Bollingerochromis mycolipis, one of my favorite Tanganyikan cichlids, presents zero pattern of differentiation with distance. And the more warmer colors here, as I pulled out this example uh, from Petrochromis orthognatus, a benthic algivore, you can see that as distance increases, genetic differentiation increases. So this variation provides us with the opportunity to test what organismal traits drive such variation. And for this, I'm using not only multiple regressions and model selection, but also a phylogenetically corrected regression using MCMC GLMM to account for this hierarchical nature of the relationships among organisms. And for uh, for the for the limits of this talk, I won't be able to discuss extensively the specific predictions that I have for the different traits in terms of the slope of IBD. But I've generated a set of of predictions for the relationship of ecological, dispersal, reproductive, and demographic traits that were rooted in knowledge of the system and or the literature, um, and then with the idea of, of finding what would be not only the, the traits that are more important in predicting the slope of IBD, but also the directionality of these relationships and contrast that with previous studies in the literature. So now again, can organismal traits predict isolation by distance? And here I have presented the average Average weight of the different predictors across models. And the, the most important by far predictor in this data set is traffic position. So lower traffic positions appear to have greater uh, slopes of IBD, or as I, I'm just going to present you right now. So as traffic position increases, you have lower values of the slope of IBD or lower population genetic differentiation. 
this is important to notice that even after accounting for phylogenetic structure. And one way to visualize this is uh, using a photo from the lake. Uh, it's, um, so organisms such as this top predator at the top uh, right of the screen, where the Gerochromis microlipis, have low values of slope of IBD or low genetic differentiation with distance, whereas organisms that are on the bottom um, right of the screen, such as this Petrochromis famula and benthic algivore, which literally is uh, feeding and defending substrate and in the, that is attached to rocks, those tend to have um, not only lower trophic position, but also a greater slope of IBD or greater genetic differentiation. So this leads me to ask, could there be connection between processes happening at the population genetic level and higher levels in terms of uh, rates of accumulations of diversity? So first I'm gonna ask, can population genetic differentiation predict the number of color morphs within a species? And for this, I have taken advantage of these uh, anecdotal evidence from the aquarium trade on the number of color morphs per species and their distributions within the entire lake. And I found that even after accounting for phylogeny, there appears to be a positive relationship. So having greater genetic differentiation or a greater value of slope of IBD is a, it's appeared to be associated with the number of color morphs within a lineage. So um, this, is, this leads me to my next question. Can these result also in a greater, in greater genus um, level species richness? So could these number of color morphs also be associated with ultimately accumulating more species in each of the lineages. And for this, we found no relationship. Uh, and it, so it's important to mention that here, the higher values of the slope of IPD do not translate into greater number of species per genus. However, this is not necessarily, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm gonna have a little bit of water. So it's important to note that even if this is um, a group of fishes that is celebrated for rapid rates of speciation, it's not, it's not necessarily that the number or the population genetic differentiation is the rate limiting step of this accumulation of diversity in the system. There could be other reasons. And I'm gonna talk about this a little bit further, but first I wanna recap by um, mentioning that we have added or contributed examples to the knowledge that we have on traits associated with greater genetic differentiation. And in this case, um, another ecological trait that has to do with the nature of the resource that these fish exploit as benthic algivores is associated with greater population genetic differentiation. Another important aspect that I want to mention is that the nature of the resource that benthic algivores exploit, in this case, uh, benthic algivores are feeding on algae that grows in rocks, are the most restricted in terms of dispersal and most affected by the distribution of the resource that they most rely on. So, an important thing to consider is the nature of the system and, and the, yeah, the, the biology of the system for this, to understand this result. Now, in terms of patterns, in terms of micro to macro patterns in evolution, previous studies had asked the same question and with finding different answers for this. In some cases, population differentiation did translate into greater species richness, and in other cases, it didn't, or it did not affect uh, variables such as speciation rates. Um, it was, uh, and other studies that have addressed these questions, for example, in orchids and birds, have also found 
divided evidence in terms of the connection between micro and macroevolutionary patterns. So with this, I want to bring in that it's interesting that I was able to detect an effect of the number of or, or the value of slope of IBD and the resulting no, number of color morphs within a lineage. And want to reiterate that this did not translate in greater number of species richness accumulated in a genus at this, in this system. And although future work should examine speciation rates and extinction rates and uh, in a broader uh, sampling of the Lake Tanganyika and species radiation. I think this is still an interesting and insightful uh, result that could actually reflect the nature of the system and a potential explanation for a disconnect between population genetic differentiation and the accumulation of species richness is that even if those populations tend to differentiate more, they this same feature of being able to differentiate more could at the same time make those populations more susceptible to other things such as extinction or could limit their dispersal greater. Uh, therefore, um, yeah, not able, like being more limited for the rates of colonizations of new habitat. And finally, just having differentiation in terms of coloration, but not in terms of ecological and resource use, could also lead that these resulting lineages or, or colorly variable uh, within species lineages do not persist uh, in after secondary contact or in sympathy therefore ultimately not increasing the number of species over time. And with those ideas, I want to finish and, and thank everybody who has supported me during this study and during my PhD journey. And I'm happy to hear questions. Great, thank you again, Jimena. Um... People, please drop your questions for her in the chat or in the Slack. Okay, uh, our first question from Andreas. Um, great talk. Do you see differences in the distribution range of species, um, for example, high versus low trophic positions that might affect the IBD slopes? Okay. So in the distri the spatial distribution of the species? Um, I'm guessing the sort of range size, like how much of the lake shore they're going around, but Andreas, feel free to <laughs> clarify in the chat as well. Yes. So like are all of these species present all the way around the lake or are some of them sort of concentrated and in certain areas and does that affect it? Yes, yeah, so there's there's variability. And one of the analyses that I'm looking also is at the number of color morphs that uh, also corrected. Of course, it, it would be an imperfect analysis because uh, we don't have, per, or perhaps we're like missing some of those color variants. But at the same, but yeah, it's an, a, a very important point and definitely correcting for the distribution in, of or like the air, the littoral area, um, yeah, that is occupied by either the number of color morphs is important for sure. Great. Um, another question. Ooh, several coming in here. Okay. Um, are species with the highest IBD slopes also the species that are social and show behaviors such as cooperative breeding? Actually, I did not um, find, so I did not test this specifically or the degree of sociality. It is true that many of these algal um, or benthic algivores interact with other species and they have interesting facilitation um, among them, but many of them, of, the, of these species, what, what is more important, and I want you to remember from this talk is that they're, even if they're able to move a lot, they're effectively glued to a substrate. They're defending this particular resource. And this is what makes more sense to why they would be so limited by the distribution of that fragmented 
resource. Um, it would be really exciting to explore this in, within more sampling within the LAMP plugins that vary a lot in terms of sociality, but uh, yes, so the data that I, that I have is the data that I have. <laughs> Great. Um, well, thank you for your talk and for answering the questions. There's a few more in the chat if you want to have a look there, but for now, we'll move on to the next talk. Thank you. Super talks. We are roaring along here. Um, it is now uh, 4 p.m. in the East, uh, and our next talk is a recorded presentation uh, by Zach Phillips, and I took the opportunity the, uh, to preview this talk and it has some cool little video Im videos embedded with some rather surprising um, behaviors in there. So stay tuned. I don't think Zach can be here. I know the talk is about 19 minutes. We'll, we'll gather up um, questions that arise or you can uh, contact him at some later point, but please uh, enjoy, enjoy the presentation. Um, we're not hearing the sound, Nick. I think maybe because, well, I don't know. Is it because you're muted? I'm sorry about that. Is anybody, is everybody else having the same problem? No one can hear? Yeah. Okay. Let me just double check something real quick here. Sorry about that. You know what? Um, this is a simple fix. And go back to it. As good as saying, but situates us geographically. Did that seem to work? Could you hear now? Or no? All good. Okay, I'll restart it. Sorry about that. Hi, everybody. I'm Zach Phillips, a PhD candidate at UT Austin in Texas. Thanks to the American Society of Naturalists for hosting this virtual conference and to everybody tuning in. Uh, these are my collaborators on different parts of the work I'll be talking about, Luke, Carolyn, and Michael, and my two advisors, Ulrich and Larry. Uh, a special thank you to Brackenridge Field Lab in Austin, where we've conducted most of our field work. There's a saying, Austin is the blueberry in the tomato soup of Texas, while well, on the Brackenridge Field Lab logo, Austin is the tiny hole in the leafcutter ant's leaf, which may not be as good a saying, but situates us geographically, at least on the leaf. And finally, thank you to Cat Metro Buses for transporting me and sometimes thousands of ants and cockroaches to and from Brackenridge. Uh, the ants and cockroaches riding on the bus with me in the main subjects of this talk are the Texas leafcutter ants and the miniature cockroach Atophila fungicola that lives inside their nests. So what is a Texas leafcutter ant colony? Well, it can be described in a few ways. It's a complex ant society and it's a mutualism between ants and fungus, which the ants cultivate for food. And colonies serve as hosts and habitats for a diversity of other organisms, including Atophila fungicola which can also be described in a few ways. It's a myrmecophile uh, because it's an obligate symbiont of leafcutter ants. And I use the term symbiont, not parasite, because it's not clear if the roaches really harm their host. Uh, it's a mutualist exploiter because Atophila exploits both the ants and the fungus, for instance, by eating the fungus and using the ants for dispersal. And it's a cockroach uh, because it's a cockroach. The main question we'll explore today is how does Atophila fungicola disperse between host leafcutter colonies? In this photo, you can see the roach attached to a leafcutter female alate or winged queen departing on its nuptial flight, which might suggest to you a straightforward answer to our question. Uh, we collect roaches attached to female alates during leafcutter colony preparations for nuptial flights, when thousands of alates, like you see here, 
both females and males come to the surface of their nest. Um, and usually about four to seven percent of female elates in colonies that have roaches have a single attached roach on them, but not the male elates. So uh, this hitchhiking behavior strongly suggests that roaches use female elates for vertically transmitting from parent leafcutter colonies to their incipient daughter colonies. In other words, that the roaches remain with female alates as they become queens initiating new colonies. And this has been the traditional assumption. However, our research indicates that early colony development limits vertical transmission and roaches predominantly use horizontal transmission between large established colonies. Uh, so here, uh, let me clarify what I mean by vertical and horizontal transmission in terms of roach dispersal. Vertical transmission generally refers to symbiont transmission from parent to offspring host. And here I use it to refer to roach dispersal from mature leafcutter colonies to their incipient daughter colonies. Horizontal transmission, on the other hand, generally refers to all other transmission routes besides vertical. And here I use it to refer to roach dispersal between large established leafcutter colonies. Um, throughout the talk, I'll more or less use the words transmission and dispersal interchangeably because transmission is just symbiont dispersal between hosts and because I just can't seem to help it. Okay, so one general reason to investigate roach transmission is to improve our understanding of symbiont transmission at the scale of a colonial or, or super organism host like a insect society. Uh, vertical transmission and horizontal transmission are associated with different ecological and evolutionary patterns, which have been well studied, but studies exploring these patterns at the level of between colony transmission, for example, between ant colonies, rather than at the level of between individual transmission, for example, symbiont transmission between individual ants, are rare and mostly restricted to a few exceptional model systems like honeybees and their parasites. Uh, Leafcutter ants and Atophila fungicola represent a non-model system in which between colony transmission dynamics can be explored, potentially leading to insights that improve our general understanding of the subject. Um, so for example, uh, the effect of the early lives of colonies on between colony transmission is largely unexplored. And as I mentioned before, it's likely a key factor affecting roach transmission. So leafcutter colonies, which develop into some of the largest superorganisms on the planet, have very humble beginnings. Uh, a female alate leaves her parent colony in a nuptial flight, mates with male alates midair, lands, and becomes a workerless queen or foundress. And this is the stage of colony development, which I'll refer to as an incipient colony. And incipient colonies have uh, minuscule amounts of, of vulnerable fungal garn and extremely high mortality rates, and only a small proportion of incipient colonies develop into the enormous superorganisms we typically associate with leafcutter ants. So the vulnerable gardens and the high mortality rates of incipient colonies um, may limit roach vertical transmission and favor horizontal transmission between large established colonies. Specifically, the gardens might not be able to withstand typical ro roach interactions, by which I mean roach behaviors that have been observed in large established gardens. And regardless of roach's effect on incipient gardens, the natural high mortality of incipient colonies could severely limit the success rate of vertically transmitted roaches. So as a consequence, Roaches might have evolved to bypass these incipient colonies by horizontally transmitting between large fungal garden rich, low mortality established colonies. Um, so to explore whether low volume fungal gardens can withstand the presence of a roach, we conducted a simple experiment which a single roach was either added or not added to an artificial foundress chamber. We hypothesize that if roaches are well adapted to persist alongside incipient gardens and thus well adapted for vertical transmission, 
they will have a neutral or beneficial effect on gardens and gardens will be able to withstand roach interactions. Alternatively, if roaches are not well adapted to persist along incipient gardens, they will harm incipient gardens. And the results of the experiment indicate that an accelerated rate of garden failure is associated with the presence of a roach. So the lower curve here shows the declining proportion of surviving gardens with a roach present, and the upper curve shows the declining proportion of surviving gardens uh, with no roach. So what roach behaviors could be responsible for harming the low volume fungal gardens? Well, in more than half of the founders chambers with roaches, we observed roaches physically disrupting gardens in ways that could be catastrophic for incipient gardens, but likely have negligible effects on the enormous gardens of established colonies. And these behaviors include uh, feeding on the garden, uh, rubbing against the garden, which might be a way for the roach to acquire the colony's chemical profile, um, high speed collisions with the garden, which is, is pretty much what it sounds like, and uh, stressing the foundress, which we didn't score as a physical disruption, but could still be a significant source of garden deterioration. So in this video, uh, this is a roach apparently disturbing a foundress. You can see the foundress trying to groom off the roach with her legs. There she goes, ah, success. And now the foundress returns to tend to her garden. Uh, so consistent with the results of our experiment, field surveys suggest roaches rarely or never cohabit with foundresses and therefore seem to be rarely vertically transmitted. Um, most mature colonies at our sites in Austin have roaches, but roaches haven't been collected attached to postnuptial foundresses at those same sites. Uh, also, despite hundreds of foundresses collected and incipient colonies excavated in Texas, roach has only been observed once attached to a foundress seeking a nest site, and the roach abandoned the foundress as she was collected by the uh, entomologist, my advisor. So in light of the results of our experiment and surveys, we're left wondering, could roaches be hitchhiking on female alates for reasons other than vertical transmission? Um, maybe roaches use female alates for horizontal transmission, abandoning alates after nuptial flights for established colonies. And I call this mode of horizontal transmission female alate vector transmission. Uh, a requirement for female alate vector transmission is that at least some female alates land close enough to established colonies for roaches to encounter them. And we regularly observe Texas leafcutter female alates and foundresses landing and beginning new nests near established colonies. Also, field experiments and surveys in a few other leafcutter species have shown, um, and I'll, I'll quote this H.G. Fowler paper here, they've shown coloniz colonization attempts were greater in areas occupied by mature colonies con specifics, probably due to disturbance caused by large colonies. Uh, and this uh, female alate vector transmission would be consistent with one of the principles of Jackie Chan chase sequences, which simply stated is that a dispersal agent and passenger don't always share a destination. Uh, okay, so here this diagram shows vertical and female alate vector transmission, the two potential modes of roach dispersal that both begin with hitchhiking on female alates, but end with either an incipient colony or an established colony as a roach's destination. Um, to determine if roaches display dispersal behaviors consistent with female alate vector transmission or vertical transmission, I conducted a few behavioral assays in the field uh, and attempted to answer the following questions. Do roaches abandon foundresses? Can roaches use colony foraging lines to infect established colonies? And can individual roaches ride female alates, abandon them, and use foraging lines to infect established colonies? 
Now this study is in the current January 2021 issue of the American Naturalist. And I'm just going to broadly mention the results here and show a few of the articles supplementary videos that illustrate the roach behaviors. Here you can see a roach attached at the waist of the foundress as she's excavating. And here you see that same roach has abandoned the foundress while the foundress continues to excavate. And here the roach wandering down this foraging trail is about to do an impressive backflip. There, did it onto a leaf carried by a forager. Let me show that one more time. There it goes. Here, backflip, nice. All right. And then this roach is on the leaf of a stalled forager in the center of the picture right now, and we'll switch over to a mobile forager. So the roach is here, there we go. And I'll switch over, nope, off we go. And here a roach abandons a female alien under attack and then rides a leaf towards the forager's nest. So there's the female alien under attack. Okay. So the behaviors observed during these experiments are consistent with female alien vector transmission, not vertical transmission. And the multiple hitchhiking behaviors suggest roaches might benefit by hitchhiking twice on a journey between host colonies. First, hitchhiking on female alates for emigrating from upstream host colonies, then hitchhiking on foragers or, or what the foragers carrying, uh, returning to their nests for infecting downstream host colonies. Still, how the roaches initially encounter foraging trails uh, remains unclear. Also, our results generally don't discount the possibility of vertical transmission, and Adaphila fungicola may use both vertical and horizontal transmission. Um, individual roaches might even be able to decide which route to take after nuptial flights, potentially basing their decision on encounters with founders predators, such as entomologists or armadillos, less clumsy predator. So if roaches use female alates for horizontal transmission, why don't they ride male alates for the same purpose? Because, um, I mean, we only find roaches on female alates, uh, not male alates. This could be because female alates are superior vectors rather than because female alates are uniquely capable of facilitating vertical transmission. Female alates are larger and probably better at hauling roaches on flights than male alates. And females may tend to land closer to established colonies than males uh, because males after mating midair are essentially without purpose or direction and likely without targeted destinations. Um, and just for comparison, army ant male alates are, are actually likely vectors of horizontal transmission for some of their symbionts. Um, because, and, th and this actually has been proposed for rove beetles that live with some army ants like Eseton burchellii. Uh, and this is likely because Eseton burchellii male alates leave their parental colonies and enter other colonies to mate with wingless queens. Um, the Eseton burchellii doesn't have female alates, doesn't produce female alates, just has wingless queens. So it could have different sex biased alate vector transmission among different uh, ant species with different types of life cycles. Okay. So Adaphila fungicola isn't the only Adaphila species and there are lots of Adaphila living outside of Texas uh, throughout Central and South America with other leafcutter ants. And this provides us with an opportunity to explore the evolution of between colony transmission under a variety of conditions, including those created by um, environmental factors and host phenotypes. For example, higher humidity, greater density of host colonies and a larger host species range could facilitate direct horizontal transmission between colonies. Um, and 
faster growing, less vulnerable, multiple founders incipient colonies could facilitate roach vertical transmission better than incipient colonies with a single foundress that are more likely to die and produce fungal garden um, less quickly. Okay, so let's return to an earlier question. What is a leaf? I think we're gonna have to stop there to make time for the next speaker. Sorry about that. Absolutely. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, put Nick's email into the chat. And uh, we can we can um, make notes. Hopefully, Chelsea, that's okay that I'm saying that, that we can make notes if you have questions that appear there. But um, I'm also just uh, putting his email there in case you want to reach out directly. And um, yeah. Uh, so with that, uh, I want to uh, keep us on schedule and move on to our next talk, which is by Anastasia uh, Bernat, um, who is, whoops, whoops, where are my glasses? I can't read. Uh, who is going to uh, tell us about uh, the flight in soapberry bugs uh, and so more invertebrate dispersal biology for us all. Yes. Okay. All right, thank you for having me here today. I'm Anastasia Burnett under Meredith Sensor at the University of Chicago. And I'm gonna be talking about how flight potential in soapberry bugs is plastic. Why we decided to study dispersal is because it's ubiquitous across many biological systems like monarch migrations, sea dispersal, and as we're very familiar with right now, viral transmission. But dispersal is also a really useful indicator of many behavioral, ecological, and evolutionary processes like metapopulation dynamics, succession, and gene flow. And it can vary on the individual level where behaviors and traits are either fixed or more plastic, allowing for a wider range of dispersal ability and performance. Some plastic traits can be morphological, developmental, reproductive or time dependent, and insect species have variable dispersal abilities and types like hovering or long migration that can help them better colonize or find mates in their habitats. So researching how plastic traits in insects influence flight potential can help us understand which traits allow insects to adapt and succeed in their environment. So in our soapberry bug system, we ask questions like, why and how do insects, do insects disperse? How, and do, uh, how do female and female soapberry bugs differ in dispersal ability? How do mass and morphology influence soapberry dispersal ability? And within these questions, we wanted to look for plasticity. For example, we asked, how plastic is each sex? Meaning, does one sex have more flight potential variability than the other due to a given trait? And how does reproductive activity influence flight potential? We also ask specifically morphological, which morphological traits are plastic and which are more fixed. And finally, how do changes in mass influence flight potential? And this is an interesting question for anyone who has tested their bugs multiple times. Also we ask, but don't fully address here, how does the evolutionary history or in other words, host plant dynamics in this system direct soapberry bug dispersal ability. So I'm gonna take you through why we chose the soapberry bug and how we flight tested them and show you which flight patterns we observed between the sexes and between trials that can give us a better understanding of how plasticity can help a soapberry bug survive and adapt to its environmental and ecological system. So soapberry bugs are a great model species for dispersal research because not only are they found throughout the US, but they exhibit wing dimorphism, as you can see to the right, where there's a long wing morph and a short wing morph, which has a truncated wing. They also exhibit sexual dimorphism, as many other insects do, where the female is larger than the male. They also have a really dynamic evolutionary history where over half a century ago, soapberry bugs adapted to the introduced golden rain tree host and continued to still live on their native balloon vine host. And each host is separated spatially where golden rain tree is in the mainland and balloon vine is in the keys. So I'm gonna to talk to you about how we tested the soapberry bugs 
from Florida. So Meredith went to eight locations in Florida as seen to the right in descending latitude, and she aimed for at least 10 bugs per population. She came back with 476 soapberry bugs, and she had about two and a half more balloon vine bugs than golden rain tree bugs. We then removed all the short wing bugs because they don't fly, they have no wing muscle, and then placed them into assembled bug homes, which were made of constantly a one to one ratio of golden rain tree seeds and balloon vine seeds. They always had a two milliliter tube of deionized water, uh, filtered paper, and their cups were lined with fluon to prevent them from escaping. We then set incubators to what would be Florida's winter season average temperature, daylight hours, and relative humidity. Bugs were ID'd and randomly ordered by ID for flight testing. And the day before their trial, they received a two milliliter tube of Gatorade water made of three parts DI water, seven parts Gatorade water. And they were magnetically painted on the back of their thorax. And that's how we attached them to the flight mill. So we tested 332 long wing bugs using the flight mill for 22 days. The first trial went from mid-February to the end of February. And the second trial went from the beginning of March to mid-March. So let me show you video of this in action. So you see there are five bugs flying right now. On the flight mill arm, there is a flag that will break the beam of an IR sensor. This creates these drops in voltage that allow us to calculate uh, the speeds and distances at which these bugs are flying. So down here, you see these drops in voltage, and then we'll analyze them. Okay. There you go. And we also collected clean bug homes and fed, uh, fed seeds to the bugs on a weekly basis. So on flight trial day, we will first mass bugs before we load them into the flight mill. And when we loaded the bugs into the mill, we gave them three motivational attempts to engage in continuous flight. So for example, what that would mean is that first they were loaded, then I blew on them, then waited 10 minutes, blew on them again, waited another 10 minutes, blew on them one last time. And if they were not showing any signs of continuous flight in the, in the next 10 minutes, they were taken off and replaced. So a typical day would look like this, where each color is a bug. And if we have our bursters that all flew for less than 30 minutes and our continuous flyers that could fly for as long as 12 hours. So soapberry bugs are really strong flyers. <laughs> so it's crazy. And finally, after both the first and second trials were done, we measured their morphology, which included the thorax width and the wing length and body length to give us a wing to body ratio for our analyses. So now I'm gonna walk you through our results, which will show flight differences between the sexes and between trials. First, we found that males are twice as likely to fly as females. We also find, found that male flight is positively related to wing to body ratio. So the longer the wings compared to the body, the more likely males flew. However, wing to body ratio did not affect female flight potential. Although mass drove female flight, where heavier females were less likely to fly. While mass did not affect male flight potential. So already we are seeing strong flight differences between the sexes. And now I'm gonna talk about flight differences between trials, which will help us observe how plastic or fixed these observations are. There were two main factors that changed across trials for the soapberry bugs. That was mass and eggs laid. And we looked into how these changes would impact flight response between trials. So let's consider four flight cases and three mass cases. There are four flight cases. A soapberry bug could have flown in both trials, only in trial two, in neither trial, or only in trial one. A soapberry bug could also lose or gain mass between trials, 
where a positive value would indicate that the soapberry bug gained mass and a negative value would indicate that the soapberry bug lost mass. So I'm gonna show you a plot of how mass percent change between trials can lead to one or another flight case. And I'm gonna do that for each sex in one plot. So on the y-axis, we have our flight case probability. We have four flight cases. So there will be four lines for each sex. And on the x-axis, we have our mass percent change between trials. <clears throat> and I'm going to plot the female bugs first. So for a female bug who gained a lot of mass between trials, and that could be upwards to 40 to 100% of their original mass, that female would most likely only fly in trial one. In other words, only fly once. But for a female to fly twice, the female would need to have gained mass, but not too much in order to maximize its likelihood of flying in each trial. However, if a female lost a lot of mass between trials, then the female uh, would be most likely to not fly at all. Finally, no female bugs only flew in trial two. So you'll notice when you actually have your model all together, you'll see that there is no mass change event where a female bug would be most likely to fly twice. So a female is either most likely to not fly at all or to only fly once. All right, so now I'm gonna quickly plot the males. So the males are the dashed lines and there are a couple main points you can take away. First, you'll see that its mass percent change is much more narrow. Why? Well, most likely because they don't lay eggs. Second, you'll notice that males are most likely to fly twice regardless of any change in mass between trials. Finally, you'll see that only ma males that lose a lot of mass have a small chance of flying in trial two only. And you can actually find and look for the specific thresholds that can tell you how much mass a male or female soapberry bug would need to gain or lose in order to be more likely for a particular flight event or case. So if a female gained more than 41% of their original mass, then they're most likely to only fly once. Whereas if males lose more than 17% of their original mass, then they have a larger chance, not most likely, but a larger chance of flying only in trial two than in trial one. But there are still there is still the question about egg lane and whether these changes in female mass match up to egg lane events. Uh, we do find that more reproductively active females do way more. And we see that most females were laying eggs during trial two, which helps explain uh, why there were no females that only flew in trial one. So here's a quick recap of what I just laid out. We saw that males have a positive wing to body ratio effect and females have a negative mass effect. Males seem to be more likely to fly and to fly again. And that is because their mass is less plastic. They're able to keep their mass more stable. And so that lets them be consistent flyers. For females, mass is more plastic. So that leads to a more plastic or variable flight potential that really depends on their egg laying cycle. And this has a variety of implications. For males, it helps them avoid king competition because they're more likely to leave their host plant, look for another one, and forage and succeed in patchy habitats. So this can make them strong colonizers for food and mates. Females are more strategic because of this trade-off between dispersal and egg laying so they will need to optimize their energy and time in order to make a strong one-time flight effort or attempt before laying eggs. And in both cases, they could influence colonization and especially hybridization at the St. Patrick zone in Florida, which is right off the keys. So overall, under the context of a system like this one that has undergone rapid evolutionary change, Plasticity could help predict mobility character and agent behavior. So I'm gonna jump into our future directions and show you a glimpse at how we're analyzing and looking at our distance and performance results. 
I love this one. So we can see that silvery bugs from the keys can make it onto the mainland. Each buffer zone here plotted on this map has its radius as the max distance flown by a silvery bug for each population collection site. But what we need to look more into is who is really the colonizer for each host and how does season play into the, their dispersal abilities. And that is all I have to say. Um, thank you to my wonderful PI Meredith for her continued mentorship. Thank you to Anna Silberg who helped take flight measurements and thank you to everyone who helped create this conference. Great, thank you for that amazing presentation. I'm totally impressed by these bugs that can fly for 12 hours. I, <laughs> this whole session is making me impressed with roaches and soap fairy bugs. Um, if anyone has questions for Anastasia, yeah, great. So we have our first question. Um, could you measure or estimate the flight distance based on the flight duration of the individuals? Yeah, so um, the way that those troughs work, um, we calculate, you can calculate the time between troughs, which, um, and how long it goes for. And uh, because you know the radial distance that they travel around that flight mill arm, you can get exact the full distance um, from how long they were <clears throat> flying in the trial and um, the time events of those drops in voltage. Um, maybe a follow-up question for me. Have you ever like had one on the flight mill for a full 12 hours? Like does their performance decline over that time? <laughs> you know, um, we had no idea how long these bugs would go. So when we first did it and we were kind of shocked that some just kept going, because first we did like these mock 30 minute trials and then we're like, no, 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 let's do hour. Like they're clearly going farther. And then we're like, okay, hour and a half. They were like, forget it. Let's just let them run the whole like daylight cycle. And they will reach like the full daylight range, 14 hours and then stop it once it's dark in the incubator. But um, we haven't done the full like full lights, just run them to exhaustion yet, which kind of is like, that would be the next step, I guess. There, it's crazy. Um, okay, so given these results, do you think there's any hope of estimating a dispersal kernel for this species? What, what would mark like a dispersal kernel? What would be? Maybe sort of a, a distribution of the sort of, I guess, density of how far they disperse. So is there, are they mostly dispersing some certain distance and then a long tail? Um, and where, what shape is that? I see. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think once we look at um, specifically from which host plant is like, like kicking it over into the keys and between the mainland, will we get a good idea of like how many, how often are they traveling? How many of them? Like, is it just the males? Is it the females? Um, yeah, but I wouldn't be surprised if like certain events do happen more seasonally um, that make them kind of all go together. Um, some more questions. Uh, do you know if males have lower or higher plant host, host plant fidelity than females? Um, so the best I know about the host plants um, is that so for golden rain tree, they, it's, um, it's a one big event of like seed availability. They'll like do a massive dump in like from around November. And then um, the soapberry bugs will go into like starvation diapause for like most of like the eight months remaining because you're, they're only getting seeds for four, four months. Whereas golden rain tree, um, it's a continual annual production of seeds, but not as high frequency. And so I don't know um, how that affects fidelity, but um, that's another factor we're thinking about with flight and like when they would fly and, and what would compel them to fly if it's for survival, for food or for mates. Okay, and maybe one last question. Um, did you check for flight muscle histalization due to mating or due to feeding? That's a really great question because so, so berry bugs, um, 
they have not, in, in addition to their like short wing long wing morph um there is a cryptic morph that's long wing but the muscles will break down so you can like open them up and you'll see that there's nothing inside and that explains why they didn't fly um but one of the things we do want to do is uh digest the muscles of those that we just flight tested and see like can we match up um what's happening because on the surface just looking at short uh like wing length um is is a good proxy but it's really the muscle that is driving their flight Okay, um, thanks everyone for the questions. There's one more question from Jen Coughlin that maybe you can just look at in the chat um, and otherwise we'll move on to the, the next talk. Thank you so much. Awesome. Um, our next speaker is uh, Tomas Leon, who is going to talk about uh, flight of the mosquito, modeling the influences of landscape on movement. Tomas. Thank you. Let's see if I can share. Is that showing up okay? Yep. Great. Well, thank you. And thanks everyone who's making this conference happen. This is my first time attending and I spend a lot of time in mosquito world. So it's been fun to learn about other species and other systems. And I'm Tomas Leon. I'm from the School of Public Health at the University of California, Berkeley. And today I'll be talking about flight of the mosquito or modeling the influences of landscape on movement. So as an overview of what I'll talk about, I wanna talk about why mosquito movement matters and how it is measured. I wanna talk about then how I model mosquito movement and what's novel and what needs improvement in that. And then follow on with how these model results of movement fit into larger models of mosquito control interventions. So the problem is for mosquitoes, like other insects and other species, is that movement can be hard to describe and model, but it matters a lot for predicting how well mosquito control and disease interventions work. And that includes gene drives, which is what my research group primarily works on, which means we're using genetic modification to prevent mosquitoes from either reproducing and or transmitting diseases like malaria or dengue. And flight behavior, can be studied in lab or semi-field conditions, but as we know, it's still artificial and still doesn't perfectly reflect what happens out in the real world. And so our current best understanding is from mark release or capture experiments, MRRs, and human landing catch experiments. And there are unsurprisingly problems with these data for fitting interpretation and generalizability. One being that mosquitoes are surprisingly difficult to trap and recapture. Usually we see recapture rates in the low single percentage points or lower. Uh, as Anastasia's talk kind of pointed out in a different insect, male and female flight behavior differs quite a bit. And based on our current trapping and our current experiments, we, it's pretty hard to tell the difference between that or get a sense of it. And of course species differ, but there's just a paucity of data so for example, when we look at anopheline mosquitoes, you know, there are several in the anopheline gambier complex that differ, but just because of a lack of data, we'll use information from one species to another. And so that's a drawback. Others are just that the distance traveled by the mosquito is not the Euclidean distance. And so we'd like to account for that. And also that barriers to movement such as houses and mountains it would be nice to incorporate that into how we get data and analyze it. So one partial solution to address this that I've developed and had a lot of help on, I call MRRSIM, and it's a modeling framework to mechanistically recreate MRR experiments and fit movement patterns. And so into the model, we put information about how these MRRs are conducted. So for example, where, when, where the traps are, what the landscape characteristics are, any environmental layers that we think are influencing movement. And then depending on our system and our scenario, if we don't have any data to fit to, we can just return trap catch numbers and times. So get a dispersal kernel basically based on that. Or if we have existing data, then we can iterate and return best fits for 
the fight parameters and the simulation results using maximum likelihood methods. So I'm going to talk about two kind of systems and species today. One is Aedes aegypti in California. So this is a mosquito species that vectors dengue, Zika, a lot of arboviral diseases, and came to California, where I live, in 2013, really, and has just continued its northward expansion since then. And there's been a lot of efforts with like Wolbachia control methods to try to stop it, but it's proven pretty resilient and keeps popping up in new places every year. And then I'll also talk about Anopheles caluzii in Sao Tome and Principe. And this is an island nation seeking to move towards malaria elimination that's pretty genetically isolated. And so we don't think there's much movement off or on the island other than maybe a few plane or boat assisted movements. So the step, the first step to MR sim is that we just need to define our map or our movement range. And so these two systems are on quite different scales. So for Sao Tome, I'm showing a model for the entire island. For California, for Aedes aegypti, I'm showing basically a neighborhood, a city block. And so the framework is quite flexible to your scale. The second step is we need to set up this simulation space. And so to do that, we're looking at whatever barrier or catalyst features to movement we think they are. And so for the island of Sao Tome here, I'm just showing a basic elevation map because for based on the literature and based on our own data, mosquitoes tend not to prefer higher elevations and tend not to cross over mountains. And so we consider that a barrier to some degree. Also types of land use, so certain types of Agriculture and urbanization attract more or less mosquitoes, and so we can put that into the model. And here in the city block, you can see I've extracted the houses and the buildings and the road layers, and we can assign probabilities or likelihoods of them crossing roads, for example, depending on how wide they are. The third is to divine, define movement patterns. So these are somewhat flexible, but um, as many of you are, I'm sure are familiar, can be variations on random walks, correlated random walks, et cetera, um, with room for kind of sensing the, the resistance space around them. So how likely they are to move in any particular direction. And here's a GIF from actually the Comoros, but just giving you a sense of what some of these movement paths might look like of mosquitoes traversing that space. And then the last step, as I mentioned, is then we check to see where mosquitoes were caught in traps or died prematurely. So according to certain parameters and beliefs we have about their likelihood of being trapped or dying, then we can see if they would show up in that MRR experiment. And then based on that, we extract the final coordinates, dispersal distance, and then we're able to generate a dispersal kernel, such as the one shown at right. So we do not have data for this particular island. As you can see, it's modeling many sites in a pretty large network. So it'd be impossible to do an experiment of this size, but the hope is this is part of the UC Irvine Malaria Initiative. And so the hope is in the coming years to do a, a couple much smaller scale MRR experiments to help us parameterize this. And so now I'm just gonna show some results from the two systems. And this is from Aedes aegypti in California from a block in Clovis. And the color is showing the difference between the model and the data, where red is the model over predicting and blue is the model under predicting. And so we had two kind of back to back dusted experiments. So the mosquitoes were dusted with a colored dye and that was their mark. And so I'm gonna show the yellow one, which is here, and then the pink one, which is here, back to back. And just wanna point out that in our fitting the model to these experiments, even though these experiments were a couple of days apart, we can see pretty different trends. So if you'll notice just north of the park, which is where the release happened, there's one trap in particular where in reality, many fewer mosquitoes were caught than the model predicted. And so something hyperlocal is potentially going on there. In the second experiment, we don't have that problem. In fact, 
the model actually under predicts for that trap, whereas in a trap on the south side of the park, now it's over predicting quite a bit up there. And our hope would be in the future, if we recreate an experiment like this, we can do things like take very local wind measurements and start to see if that had any impact on the dispersal results and if we could incorporate that into the model. Now for South Tome and Principe, again, there's no data to fit, so I'm just gonna show some distributions of what kind of information we can look at. And so we run the model several times, hundreds to thousands of times, depending on you know computational load. And then we can get these distributions of mean dispersal, for example. So for that model, what do we think is the, is the mean dispersal for mosquitoes? So the, the rows are different islands. So the top row is Principe, the smaller island, and the bottom row is Sao Tome. And from left to right, we're going for increased flight time. So this is just a relative scale. So 25% of the total flight time versus 100% of total flight time allowed in the simulation. And so we can get distributions on that and then to start to think about prospectively planning our experiments and then fitting data on that. Another quantity we can look at is the leaving probability. And so in the case of Sao Tome, we're looking at the movement between towns and cities because these Anopheles are flying on the order of potentially kilometers instead of just meters or hundreds of meters. And so we're looking at their leaving probability of moving from one place to another, which is really important for things like malaria transmission. And as I mentioned before, there's for this particular geography and this particular species, we have kind of a limited literature of what we can use to parameterize. So we use several studies from mainland Africa to parameterize, but it, it will be better when we can do our own studies on Sao Tome. And this dispersal kernel, this network is then used for a larger model called MG Drive, which predicts the larger scale effects of gene edited mosquitoes on population dynamics. So let me show you what that looks like. So this shows three different mosquito release scenarios. So on the left, we have a release in the south. And to give you background, the dark purple is the natural, the wild type mosquito population. And the pink is as the gene drive takes over. And so you can see kind of this wave spread on the south happening really slowly. In the center, we had a very disseminated release. So this is showing if we release in multiple places on the island and the gene drive takes over pretty quickly. And on the right, we have a release in the capital, which then spreads from the Northeast throughout the rest of the island. And so let me just kind of begin to wrap up with a few comments on other elements that can be incorporated into the modeling. So we want to incorporate mortality into the modeling, but again, depending on the mark you use for your MRR experiments, mortality may be different. So based on that, we can differentially look at the effects of different mortality rates and then fit based on that too. So this again shows the two quantities, the proportion recaptured of mosquitoes are released and then their mean dispersal. And you'll notice that after a certain number of days, we start to get asymptotic behavior that's you know greater, the greater our mortality is. And at least for Aedes aegypti, you know, recent experience have suggested in these experiments the adult mortality being somewhere to on the order of 0.3 to 0.5 a day, which is pretty high, which again reflects our data that we're not getting very many additional captures after day four. And any priors we have on this can be incorporated into the model and then we can explore after the fact what maximum likelihood would suggest. Another thing we can explore in this framework is the influence of trap locations on your outcome data. So as I showed in the Clovis experiments, it seemed like the influence of having that one really close trap kind of skewed the results. And as you can mention, if you play a, place a bunch of traps close to the release site, you're going to catch a bunch there. And that may hinder your ability to capture longer distance movement, if that makes sense. And so these are just a different 
a couple different panels showing different release scenarios. I don't have time to go into the detail, but you can see that the shape of our expected uh, mean dispersal can be quite different based on where we site traps. So, you know, I think that's an important area of inquiry because when we design these experiments, we want the best information possible and with only so many time and resources. So we want to get the best bang for our buck for our data. So just thinking about future directions, I think a couple of big picture questions are, what is the best way to validate the dispersal kernel for Anopheles? So as I showed for 80s, we actually have MRR data to use our maximum likelihood methods for, but it's a little bit trickier for Anopheles and they're harder to capture and it's harder to run these kind of um, experiments that we could actually parameterize and get a dispersal kernel from. Another question that relates to some previous talks too is how can this kind of data and analysis be used synergistically with genetic data and close kin mark recapture data? And so this is a project that's being actively worked on by some of our collaborators. So looking at, we use the the genes as the mark, and from that we're able to infer parent offspring, siblings, and other relationships between mosquitoes. And based on that, we can estimate movement based on different life phases and actions. So for example, OV position and that kind of thing. And I think that's a really exciting field that's coming forward. And I think the two kind of approaches can be used really well together. And then the last is what about seasonality of movement? And so with MRR sim, I'm trying to account for some of the heterogeneity in space, but as we all know, there's heterogeneity in time too. So I think a big question is how much does rainfall affect movement? And, you know, we have some anecdotal evidence about it, but nothing too concrete. And so I think it'd be really interesting to use kind of a similar framework approach to look for at seasonality of movement. So I'd like to thank the Marshall Lab at UC Berkeley and my PI, John Marshall, also our collaborators in Sao Tome and the Ministry of the Environment and the National Program to Fight Malaria and others at UC Davis and Lishboa. And our funders are from the UC Irvine Malaria Initiative and DARPA. And I'd be happy to answer questions now or later. And again, I'd just like to reiterate my thanks to everyone who helped make this conference happen. So thank you. Great, thank you for that super interesting talk. Um, if people have questions as usual, please drop them in the chat um, until anyone else does. I was really intrigued by your, your maps of sort of how well the model predicted where you found um, mosquitoes or not. And so I, I'm not sure exactly how to phrase this question, but it seems like there, there is an actual change in the shape of the dispersal kernel depending on where they're released, but also there's maybe an effect of like where you're choosing to measure them. And so like there's both a biological and maybe a sort of artifact um, going on in how to estimate that kernel. So yeah, just any thoughts you had about how to sort of um, grapple with that? I'd love to hear. <laughs> yeah, it's a real, it's a really good question. And I think, you know, on the artifact side, that's, again, it goes into good planning. And so we had another experiment that cited a trap, I would call it too close to the release site. And it basically worked as a kind of a sink. It absorbed all the mosquitoes, something like 80 to 90% were captured there. So it's going to make it really hard to interpret anything from that data. Um, yeah, I think on the other hand, a big question is that I alluded to is directionality. So we don't see isotropic behavior. And so what's causing that is how much does wind play in that? And for mosquitoes, you know, there's been a lot of studies showing they go up plume, sometimes they go down plume, they go cross plume. And so it's not really easy to disentangle that effect. So I think it is kind of an open question, but certainly something's going on. Any other questions for Tomas? OK. 
Good one from Jeanette. Do you think the issue of trap locations effect on estimating dispersal is especially important when traps are attractive? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question and a really good point for two reasons. One is that in the model, we can assign a certain level of attractiveness to the trap. So they're gonna influence the model results on the one hand. On the other hand, an ongoing issue in the mosquito world is making a better trap since recapture rates are mm -hmm. so small. And they've found that, you know, even when you move a trap across a yard, it changes its recapture quite significantly, depending on shade, the vegetation next to it, et cetera, et cetera. So that is, I think, a big issue. Lots of interesting stuff to try to figure mm -hmm. out. Um, Great. Well, I think we will move on to our next speaker. Thank you for your talk and your answers. And back to you, Jeanette. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, so we have a, a break after this next talk. So hold on to your seats uh, for uh, 20 more minutes. Our, our next speaker is uh, Lee Altenberg, who's going to talk to us about going against the flow, selection for countercurrent dispersal in Oh, gyres? Is that the right way to say that? Gyres. Gyres. Oh, gyres. Okay. Hi, can everybody hear me? Okay. Great to see everybody here. It would be nice to be in the real SLMR, but this will have to do. So, <clears throat> you see the slides okay? Okay, good. So gyres and eddies are ubiquitous in the ocean. And this is going to be a theory talk about the evolution of dispersal in the face of circular flows. So the basic question is, do gyres through spatially variable habitats select for particular dispersal strategies? And is there an evolutionarily stable dispersal strategy in gyres? <clears throat> and the finding, mathematical finding is yes, that positive rheotaxis has an emergent selective advantage in the situation and that reversible dispersal is an evolutionarily stable strategy. And the generalities here in the analysis, it, it accounts for any number of habitat patches, arbitrary population growth rates among patches and arbitrarily non-reversible dispersal patterns. So please don't hesitate to interrupt if you have any questions. So uh, here's just a, a, an example of a gyre of the circular dispersal pattern in the ocean. And um, so let me get right down to the model of how you would model uh, population dynamics in such a situation. So uh, can you see my cursor moving? Okay, good. So here we have X is the population in patch I at time T plus one. And that is simply the sum of over all the patches X sub J at time T of a growth rate uh, in, in patch J, and then this dispersal kernel, the probability that uh, individual in patch J moves to patch I, and then you sum over all the source patches, and that's what you get for the number in patch I at the next time increment. So uh, in matrix representation, this is just a vector X of the population sizes over all the patches, and that's at time T plus one is equal to the M, the, dis the dispersal, kernel times G, the growth diagonal matrix of growth rates times the X in the previous time increment. So here in particular, neither population regulation nor costs of dispersal are being modeled. Now the spectral radius, which is the largest eigenvalue of this matrix product MG determines the long-term growth rate of the population. So the limit in long time of the num total number uh, in the population goes to this spectral radius to the T power times a constant times the initial population. And so this row of MG is the spectral radius since the maximum of the absolute value of the eigenvalues of M times G. Any questions? Okay, so I'm gonna introduce a, a population metric I call the fitness abundance covariance. This was first, it was uh, published in ecological monographs in 2012, and it's basically nobody has ever cited it. 
So, um, but I think it has some use. So let me explain it. So it's a measure of the covariance between habitat quality, which is to say growth rates, and the excess population caused by heterogeneity and habitat quality. So let me show you how that looks. So let pi be a vector, the stationary distribution of the population under the action of the dispersal kernel by itself. And let V be the stationary distribution when you have the dispersal kernel multiplied by the different growth rates. And then V minus pi is the population excess caused by the habitat quality G. Fitness abundance covariance is simply the covariance between growth rates and that difference in abundances from basically with different growth rate message. My internet connection is unstable. I hope it holds. Okay. So here is a, a, uh, a general uh, theorem about conditions that give you a positive fitness abundance covariance. Now, you might expect that uh, it would always be positive, but in fact, it's not the case. So the conditions that give you a positive fitness abundance covariance are if dispersal is reversible and not all patches have the same growth rate and perturbations from the stationary distribution decay without oscillation, which is to say all the eigenvalues of M are positive. And note, this is a very general theorem. It applies to all landscape topologies and heterogeneous growth rates. Now, let's look at an example of dispersal that's the opposite of reversible, which is cyclic dispersal. And this dispersal kernel, represented as a matrix, we have ones along the superdiagonal and one down here. So it, it basically, this is what represents a gyre moving around in a circle. And then our dynamical equation is then our x is at time t plus one. Here's the cyclical dispersal. Here's the growth rates. And here's the population numbers at time uh, t. And here we get a, a very interesting result. That cyclical dispersal always creates negative fitness abundance covariance. And here's the theorem that describes that which is to say organisms are always in the wrong place under cyclical dispersal. So here's a numerical example. So you have the gyre, the circulation moves you through the patches in this direction. When you get to 12, you go back to the beginning. And here are the stationary distributions. So orange, these are the, I just chose these at random. And these are re just a randomly chosen population growth rates in different patches. And blue is the stationary distribution under this circular dis uh, dispersal and these particular growth rates. And if you, and if you notice, so here's a, here's a peak and here's a trough in the actual distribution. And if you look at the correlation between these two curves, it's negative 0.639. So in fact, you will always get a negative correlation. So here's just a, a nine random examples showing you the with the, these random patch growth rates in orange and then the stationary distributions and you will see that they always all of them have negative correlations so here's minus 0.4 minus 0.6 point, point 0.4 minus 0.54 uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. and this uh so uh and so this is a a, a universal property that this fitness abundance of uh, uh, fitness abundance covariance is always negative in circular dispersal. So on average, uh, your organisms are always in the wrong place on average. That is overall, they have high abundance in poor habitats and low abundance in good habitats overall. So might this state of affairs create a selective opportunity for organisms that counter the cyclical dispersal that go against the flow? And in fact, yes. So here's a forward cycle, and here's the reverse cycle. So now the ones are along the subdiagonal, and uh, we we can now imagine so a sequential situation. So here the order here is their differential growth in the habitats, the G, and then the C is the cyclical dispersal caused by current, and then the reverse cycle is 
uh, parameterized by this alpha. And this is something that the organism itself would do going in reverse. And using a really foundation of Sam Carlin, uh, and he, he, we see that actually the growth rate of an invader is maximized when alpha is equal to one. And in that case, uh, the this is effect alpha equals one. And so the consequencing rates of counter current dispersal. Now let's look at a situation, more complex dispersal, not a simple cycle, but some more complex uh, kernel. And here we have a model, a probabilistic model of counter current dispersal. So let's consider an arbitrary dispersal pattern M the stationary distribution again of pi. And now you can define the reverse dispersal matrix in terms of the diagonal of matrix of this pi, the transpose of M, and it's the inverse of the diagonal. And that there is a technical uh, explanation if anyone wants to look at it. So M is irreversible if M is not equal to this inverse dispersal pattern. And Suppose an individual chooses reverse dispersal with probability alpha. And then what do we get? So here, an obscure theorem from linear algebra, Levinger's theorem, uh, comes to help us. And that basically, if you have a combination of a matrix A and its transpose, and you have a, a weighted average of those two, the spectral radius of that increases strictly uh, as you, as you move the weighted average towards a half from any point. And so what that means here is for this dispersal growth system that um, which we, we write it out here using this probability of, of that with probability alpha you follow M and with probability alpha you follow the transvert, the trans, uh, the, excuse me, the reverse of M then whenever the, the uh, distributions of these two extremes differ, then a behavioral variant with any degree of reverse dispersal can always invade the population. And the closer the dispersal is to reversible, which is alpha near one half, uh, so that would be in this graph, it would be alpha right here, that's the peak. The closer it is to alpha equals one half, the higher the growth rate of the invader. And that reversible dispersal then is the evolutionarily stable strategy. So the implications of this is that populations at equilibrium under irreversible dispersal can always be invaded by dispersal strategies that bring it closer to reversibility. And when the irreversibility is due to transportation by currents, this creates selection for countercurrent dispersal, that is positive rheotaxis. And in fact, many ocean organisms do exhibit positive rheotaxis. And here's just a list, sea urchins, carp, eels, nudibranchs. Um, and so suppose, here's some speculations, if countercurrent dispersal evolves for ocean species, set them up, or you might say pre-adapt them to discover river and stream habitats by using their countercurrent dispersal on those streams and swimming upstream. So to wrap it up, there's uh, Hayes et al. asked this question in their paper, Key Questions in Marine Megafauna Movement Ecology. Are there simple rules underlying seemingly complex movement patterns and hence common drivers for movement across species? And in response to that, I would say as a take home, be on the lookout for the evolution of active countercurrent dispersal or other countermeasures to currents in pop, uh, to currents in populations that are passively carried by currents through heterogeneous habitats. And let me acknowledge my funding sources: the Stanford Center for Computational Evolutionary and Human Genomics and the Foundational Questions Institute. And I thank you for your attention. And I'll take any questions you may have. Great, thank you so much, Lee. Um, we have so far one question from Nick. 
Um, so I'll read this for you. There is an analogous phenomenon in population and community ecology named fitness density covariance coined by Chesson. Um, it might be interesting to look up that letter literature, but the question is, the model assumes no costs of dispersal and no density dependence. It seems like there must be some cost, either of dispersal or density dependence, that is sufficiently strong to make reversible dispersal maladaptive. Do you have any instinct for how those would work? Okay, so those are the, the two uh, perfect questions that I would anticipate. So number one, uh, in terms of population regulation, because these are all models of invasion of populations at equilibrium, the, the regulation is not, uh, the regulation would be included in that. So it would be, the, those it would alter the growth rates. So whatever the growth rates are under population regulation, uh, th that uh, this invasion will happen. So, so that in would include population regulation. It would just be, you'd have to, it would be a, a little more involved model. So, um, the uh, now as to the cost, so it depends on the growth rate. So if you happen to go through a patch that's lethal, then there's extremely strong selection for not doing that. Okay, and so that could drive potentially drive very uh, uh, allow you to overcome a strong cost to counter current dispersal. So how how much um, the selective fuel there is to pay for the cost of dispersal depends on the particulars of the habitat uh, heter heterogeneity. And in particular, how in a, in a cyclical dispersal, uh, how the worst habitats are. Uh, does that answer your question? I'll see if Nick pops back into the chat to answer whether that <laughs> answers his question, but um, we've had another question come in. So um, this person is curious if the model accounts for different sized ocean gyres and does this play a role in dispersal assuming that some gyres will be larger or stronger than others? So the model is general, general enough to include all, that, all those possibilities. It doesn't make any, any constraints about the uh, size. So all different kinds of sizes of patches and dispersal patterns in this in the analysis. I should mention that's uh, that's how I like to model. I had to make uh, I, I'd like to get it as general as possible and to come up with a result. So the next question is: How would behaviors that actually favor low dispersal fit into this framework? Okay, so that's another. So uh, if we just these models the the kind of variation in dispersal has been very restrained. So what you're talking about is a different kind of variation in dispersal that's down dispersal uh, uniformly. And there you have what's called the reduction principle enter, which is that you always have selection for uh, reduced uh, changes in state in, in both dispersal and also in mutation and in recombination. And it's all the same math underlying mathematics. And uh, so you, you, would, you would also get selection for uh, any reduce reductions in all dispersal. And that's in that theorem by Carlin actually gives you an extremely general proof of that, uh, of that phenomenon. Okay, uh, we have a great question from Kathleen Lauterhouse. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, how would you propose that empiricists test this theory? <laughs> Oh uh, boy. Well, so getting the exact numbers is, is challenging. And that's why I, I think it's good to get as general analytic results as you can. But I would say, look for associations first. Uh, so look at species that are in the situations where an ex exogenous force is moving them around in a non-reversible way. And then look for uh, behaviors that would seem to counter that passive dispersal. And um, then you know. Then the next step is you know what you what you do in all the cases of supposing that there's some kind of uh, evolved phenotype. Um, you know, you look at phylogenetics, uh, and just try to see if it's derived or uh, ancestral characters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
I'm sorry, I can't offer better help than that. <laughs> um, okay, we have another minute or so before our break. If there's any last questions for Lee. But in the absence of one popping in, oh, maybe on the Slack. Yes, okay. Um, a question from the Slack channel. Um, do the results depend on heterogeneity of G? With parenthesis, I think so. So the, the intensity of the selection for the, the countercurrent dispersal depends uh, completely on the, the values of G, but not the sign of it. Uh, the sign is always going to be positive for invasion. Uh, the strength of invasion then depends on the, on the particular pattern, how the pattern of G's values uh, relates to the dispersal pattern. Okay. Um, well, with that, I will um, hand it back to Jeanette, I guess, or just say we're headed make towards the break. <laughs> Yeah, that's Let me right. Make one more acknowledgement that yep. the, the picture in the background is a uh, Lipikita rockii, an endemic species in Hawaii, lowland dry forest, which is uh, a very uh, endangered ecosystem. Cool. Awesome. So um, with that, yeah, we'll put a pause in our proceedings and uh, reconvene here in 20 minutes. Um, check your local clocks because I have no idea what time it is where I am. It says 520 on my sheet. And so we'll see you in 20 minutes. Okay, so our next speaker uh, is Mia Waters, who's going to talk to us about history's influence on the spatial structure of population divergence via ecological persistence. Off to you, Mia. Thanks so much, Jeanette. Um, okay, so hi everyone. Thanks so much for joining me today. This is really exciting um, to still have this conference going even though we're all in our respective places in the world. Um, it's still really exciting to start the new year hearing all these awesome talks. Um, so today I'm going to be, oh, I wanted to start my timer. Okay, uh, so today I'll be sharing preliminary results from one of my PhD projects here in Rachel Germain's lab at the University of British Columbia. Um, but this project was actually done in California, not far from Monterey and Asilomar. Okay, so to mentally position us, here's the landscape that I'll be talking about today. Different populations of species are assembling on this landscape as the building blocks of communities, each of them evolving independently as well as interdependently. And in highly heterogeneous landscapes such as this, the stories of these populations can be very different across what we consider to be small geographic areas. So these heterogeneous landscapes are made up of microsites of differing abiotic as well as biotic similarity to each other, which I've exaggerated here with different colored circles. Um, and these sites are sometimes in close proximity to each other. So for plants, dispersal across these landscapes move seeds, often within their own patch, but sometimes into novel environments, which could be similar to their home location or quite different. And as these seeds are moving across the landscape, they're carrying their population's histories with them. So this history can be broken down into two factors, evolutionary history in terms of the, their local adaptation to the environment, as well as maternal effects, which I'm considering to be an ecological history that can heavily influence the success of these first offspring that when they arrive at a new site. So this is when the environment of the mother plant influences the phenotype of their offspring, preparing them for their future environment in a way that increases their fitness. So an individual's success following dispersal depends on a combination of these two aspects of history the evolutionary and the ecological, which have both been studied a ton independently in this and in so many other systems, um, but less often are their roles disentangled side by side. So next then, we can then further decompose these histories into the two interacting factors that are varying across these heterogeneous landscapes. So first is the abiotic environment. So soil conditions such as moisture, minerals, and nutrients determine the success of plants in any given environment. And, and these dispersing individuals are carrying 
all of their previous adaptations and histories to this home environment wherever they go. And second is the biotic environment or the structure of their home communities. So what were the interactions that they were experiencing at home with who, what types of interactions, how strong are they, how diverse is the community, et cetera. And in heterogeneous landscapes, these communities, as well as the soil that they live on, are varying drastically over short distances. So the foundation of this project was the prediction that all of these aspects of history combine to determine persistence as well as reproductive success in the new environment. And so if this is the case, then populations coming from more similar home environments, so shown here by the different colors, will fare better than those coming from very different environments. And these populations might not even be able to persist at all. So my overarching question then is when populations disperse across heterogeneous landscapes, how much of their success and fitness can be predicted by these different histories? And so we took this question to the serpentine grasslands in California, which is a highly heterogeneous landscape. Uh, some patches have high amounts of serpentine rock in the soil, which introduces high amounts of magnesium, which also alters the calcium magnesium ratio and makes it difficult for most plants to survive. Um, these serpentine patches are dominated by plants that have been adapted to live along this harshness gradient. So at McLaughlin, Mc, <laughs> at McLaughlin Natural Reserve, we chose the site pictured here to be our common garden because it's intermediate in terms of the serpentine harshness. So we planted seeds of the annual grass Vulpia microstachys from 23 populations from all over the reserve. And we have abiotic data for 19 of these populations and they're plotted here showing where along our harshness gradient that they fall. So the local population is on the far left um, and you can see from the color that it's intermediately harsh. And we're defining harshness here as an aggregate of the calcium to magnesium ratio with high magnesium relative to calcium indicating harshness. And, and we're also including nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and organic matter. So there are other environmental variables that I'm looking at outside of this talk, but these so far seem to be the strongest factors that are characterizing harshness in this habitat. So we can see that some of the populations are coming from intermediate um, harsh abiotic conditions similar to that of the local population, as well as the common garden conditions that they're all planted in. Um, whereas others are coming from either harsher or more benign abiotic histories. So in the, in the common garden, uh, we planted seeds from each population into these little tubes that we hammered into the ground in plots with either competitors removed, as you can see on the left, where we removed all the debris and swept away all the fallen seeds. And then also plots with competition, as you can see on the right, where we kept the biomass and the whole seed bank intact. And so that's to contrast competition without competition. And then to disentangle the role of maternal effects, we planted field collected seeds from each population, as well as seeds from the same populations, but that had been produced by a generation grown first in the greenhouse to standardize for any field-based differences in the population's ecological histories or their maternal effects. And ta-da, this is what the plots looked like in the spring. So the cleared plots still had some competitors that snuck in around the tubes, um, but overall they were still much more cleared out than the natural plots, which we see on the right. So of the almost thousand seeds that I planted for this experimental dispersal event, 27% of, the, of them germinated and survived until the spring. So I was actually really surprised by how low that is. Um, so this could be because of dormancy or viability, but in contrast of the plants that germinated and survived to the spring, 93% of them uh, produced seeds. So while germination rates were pretty low, reproduction rates were very high. Um, so neither of these outcomes varied significantly by history of which populations the seeds came from but the greenhouse seeds did germinate a little bit more than the field collected seeds. And there was bigger germination and survival overall in the plots with competitors removed. So with all that being said, now we can move on to the reproductive fitness um, in these plants that established. So of the plants that established and produced seeds, how many seeds did they, how many seeds did they produce? So I'm using this um, as my main proxy for fitness. 
So here we have the field source plants on the left and greenhouse source plants on the right. And these are split into those plots with competitors removed and uh, competitors included. So my prediction here is pretty straightforward that competitors would have an overall limiting effect on fitness. And so in the cleared plots, the focal plants would thrive and produce more offspring. And then I also expected there to be assistance in these field plants from maternal effects uh, from all the population's home sites. And when these maternal effects were removed from the greenhouse generation, I expected that these plants would then have lower fitness. And our results match this first prediction. So in the field source plants, we did find that plants had higher reproductive fitness in the absence of competitors. And then we actually see a similar pattern in the greenhouse source plants, which indicates that the biotic environment is important and maternal effects are maybe less important. So this result that's averaged across populations is intuitively pleasing, but when we look closer at what's happening in the different populations, we start to find some really interesting variation among these different populations that may or may not allow us to understand more. So now we're going to look at the same arrangement, but now the mean number of seeds produced per population on the y-axis. So here, each point is the mean number of seeds for each population in each treatment. So from this, we see that while most of the populations do better in the plots without competitors, albeit to different degrees, um, as we can see from the magnitude of all these negative slopes between the treatments, several of the populations actually saw an increase in fitness, which we see in the positive slopes um, when the competitors were present. So interestingly, the local population did quite poorly in its own site, which I've highlighted in red here. So the field source plants barely grew and then they produced no seeds when they did. And the greenhouse seeds fared a little bit better, especially when competitors were moved. But when you compare it to the range that we see in all these other populations, it actually seems pretty um, maladapted. So this isn't necessarily surprising, despite how many of us think that local ad adaptation is everywhere. It just makes sense that it would be, you know, but the more we look for it, it becomes clear that maybe there are a lot of other reasons why we shouldn't expect it. Um, particularly in heterogeneous landscapes. And that's something that I'm looking forward to exploring more in the future. But this now harkens back to the meat of my initial question. So is all this variation among these different populations due to their histories in this heterogeneously harsh landscape? And does environmental similarity matter if even the local population isn't thriving? So to refresh, I predicted that fitness would be determined by similarity between the population's um, historical sites and the common garden. So the populations from the most similar would do, do the best and fitness would decrease then as their history became more dissimilar to the common garden. So if their histories don't match up in any way with their current circumstances, I expected that maybe they would suffer. And I found that here there isn't that pattern at all. Um, so again, I'm showing the local population in red, but the populations with most similar environments to it, or that's where they're coming from, um, are lighter green in color and they're all over the place. So meanwhile, the most dissimilar populations are also not following any particular trends, so the darkest ones. Um, okay, so the next thing that I predicted that um, I predicted that either fitness would be influenced by the population's history of harshness, so fitness in this case could be based purely on the quality of the historical site. So maybe plants from better histories do better simply because they're just more robust. Or populations from harsher environments will maybe do better when they're like released from this history. And populations from more benign histories might suffer then in the intermediate harsh common garden. And again, the results here are not super illuminating. So it's not as clear as what I expected. Um, so here there doesn't seem to be that there's, there's that much that can be predicted by the history of harshness, um, except for maybe in these populations from the most benign sites around the reserve, um, shown in dark purple. The fitness of these populations seems to be fairly consistent in the field source seeds, um, regardless of their biotic environment, uh, when their maternal effects are retained. However, when these maternal effects are removed in the greenhouse plants, um, their fitness becomes a lot more variable. 
So the last thing I'll show you is more of a note of intrigue in the same line of thought about harshness. So here I have all 19 populations on the X axis and their total reproductive fitness is on the Y. And then I've, yeah, so these populations were grouped by location around the reserve and these geographic groups I marked by the blue boxes. Um, so if they were very close to each other in the reserve, they would be within the same box. So we were curious whether spatial proximity might just be a simple explanation for the patterns that we're finding, maybe just due to gene flow. Uh, so basically did, did fitness vary across this broader scale of heterogeneity? And it looks like no, not really. <laughs> so here are the points shaded by their harshness again and shaped by whether they were in the competition or the cleared plots. So again, most populations had higher fitness when competitors were removed, which we see in the circles. And so what I think is interesting from this plot though, is less about the spatial aspect that we were looking at, um, but that the populations from intermediate harshness seem to be the most variable in their total amount of reproductive fitness with some individuals producing way, way more seeds than average. And this says something to me about maybe having like a just right or some sort of best matching history. Maybe that allows for the chance of very high fitness, um, but with a lot of variability around it. And this tells me that we need to better understand the influence of history, maybe on an individual's pluck or luck. Um, like, I'm just so curious what happened with these extreme individuals and how often is this happening? How does this help to move these populations forward? And why do we not find this happening in, a, in the other populations? So as you can see, I have a lot of remaining questions. And for this data set, I think I'll get more clarity next from looking more into the differences among the communities. So to go back to closer to the beginning, I showed you um, just a blanket with competitors without competitors, um, which was significant. But next, I'll be delving more into this to look at, you know, community compos composition differences, as well as the biotic similarity among these different sites. So to summarize, the outcome of ecological and evolutionary history varies a lot among the populations that I looked at. And neither history of abiotic harshness or of similarity to the local environment can entirely explain this variability. So I expected similarity to explain everything, but instead it might be environmental gradients in general, or even just individual variation within a population. Um, or maybe dispersal is high enough in this environment to make fitness more or less random over time. And that's maybe why we're not picking up any of the signals that we expected. Or, a final or, <laughs> since removal of the local biota increased fitness for most populations, does this answer maybe arise from their biotic histories? And all I can say for this now is stay tuned to find out. Um, and with that, I'd like to shout out special thanks to my advisor, Rachel Germain, and lab mate, Jawad Sakarchi for the fun fieldwork and the endless support along with the rest of our lab. Um, as well as Alec Kiono, who went out last year and saved all of our projects from COVID. <laughs> Um, yeah, and thanks to everyone who coordinated this conference um, for coordinating and running this session so well, and for all of you for coming to watch me. And I'm happy to take questions now. I, yeah, I did leave some time. Um, or feel free to contact me later, because um, I'm still very much in deep in the midst of analyzing and interpreting these data. So I'd really love to hear your thoughts and ideas. Hmm. Great. Thanks so much, Mia. We have already had questions pouring in, so this is obviously a great talk. <laughs> um, great. So um, I'll start with this one from Jen. Um, do you think other aspects of harshness might better explain these patterns, like maybe water availability? It's, it's possible for sure. And that's some of the, one of the things that I know we have in our environmental data that isn't actually data I collected. It's um, from other studies that I'm bringing into this, but it's all about the same sites. Um, and we do have the amount that the soil holds onto moisture, um, but roughly, Rachel would be better at answering this, but I think all of the populations around the reserve are getting roughly the same amount of water, but I can't say off the top of my head, maybe one of them is next to like a stream or something, but that's, I think that it's very, 
likely that either I haven't found the right explanation for harshness in general, or maybe there's something specific that I need to look at for Volbia, um, the focal species that I was looking at. Yeah. Um, another question about sort of this greenhouse aspect of the experiment. Um, do you think if selecting seeds from the greenhouse, you might be sort of artificially selecting them for poor competitors, which would then affect your predictions about maternal effects? I like that question. I, I've thought a lot about what the greenhouse environment is doing to select in terms of like the abiotic condition. And they, they were grown in kind of like an intermediate soil type. So yeah, if anything, they'll have standardized maternal effects for like a more intermediate environment, I believe. But um, thinking about it in terms of competitors, that's such a good question. And I'm gonna have to think more on that. <laughs> I don't have an immediate answer but that's a great point to bring up. Um, okay, there's two more questions. I'm not, hopefully we'll have time for both of them. Um, so one from John Thompson, at these small sites, could there be interbreeding depression in the local plants compared with seeds from elsewhere? There could be, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great, concise yeah. answer. <laughs> Um, a question from Peter Ralph, which is also one that I had actually, um, do you have a guess at how the distance between sites compares to the mean dispersal distance? Oh, sorry, say it again. The, so just... basically how you have collected these seeds from different sites, how far apart are these sites um, or no. microsites and how does that compare to sort of dispersal by this species? Like their natural dispersal. So yeah. this was very, it was much larger than they would probably be able to disperse on their own. Like some of these populations are coming from the other side of the reserve and Volpia has a pretty small dispersal bubble, um, but over enough time maybe, but yeah, I, I'm happy to chat more about that in depth um, off of this if we wanna continue it. Yeah, I know I'm out of time. <laughs> maybe you can follow up in the chat. Um... Yeah, sounds good. Awesome, Great. I will stop sharing. I was just going to break in and say that um, the, the next talk, unfortunately, had to be canceled. And so you're free to move on to another session if you want to uh, slip out and <clears throat> go see another talk and rejoin us in 20 minutes. But um, yeah, if you want to take another question or two, sure, you could do that here, um, just to say. <clears throat> Thank you. Hope the other person's okay. Yeah, the only um, other question we have here is sort of a follow up from Peter, just the question, pollen question mark. <laughs> That's it. I wasn't sure if you were talking about seed dispersal or also pollen. Oh. Dispersal. That's, I should have been way more clear about that. Yeah, it's purely seed dispersal. Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I basically, yeah, for my like experimental dispersal, I planted one seed in, um, yeah, each of those little tubes that I showed in the field. So that way I could look at, yeah, whether that plant grew in the tube or, or not. And so, yeah. Yeah, I haven't gotten into pollen at all yet. Okay, well, I guess we are formally on a break. As I said, um, Courtney had to uh, cancel her talk, unfortunately. So <clears throat> we'll stay on schedule. Um, Megan will be up next in about, what, 18 minutes or so. And so um, I encourage you to... All right. <clears throat> I hope everyone's doing really well out there. We're coming into the... Well, we're not quite in the home stretch. We've got five talks ahead of us um, and really the quality of the talks this afternoon has been awesome and so I'm really looking forward to this next set. Um, our next talk is by uh, Megan Soika and Megan has pre-recorded her talk but is present here to respond to questions and so um, please be ready with your questions. We've mostly been using the chat but you can also use the Slack channel for questions and yeah we're ready off we go. Hi there, so thanks everyone for tuning in. 
My name is Megan Soika, and I'm currently a PhD student at the University of Wyoming. But today I'll be presenting my master's research, which I finished uh, this summer from working with Rachel Germain at UBC, titled Persistence Across Habitat Boundaries, Revealing the Demographic Fates of Failed Dispersal in Patchy Landscapes. So in patchy systems, metapopulation persistence depends on dispersal between the patches. And realized dispersal is the rate of dispersal between given patches, taking into consideration only the individual who contributes to the next life stage, as shown here in dark orange. The orange line overall illustrates a dispersal kernel where there is a high probability of a seed landing close to the parent plant. Because of this, realized dispersal considers only the small percentage of offspring that make it to suitable habitat and reproduce. Yet whether or not dispersal is limited between these populations, individuals will land between the patches. And these individuals aren't considered in population or patch models typically, as they don't contribute to the growth in the next generation within either patch. So because of this omission, um, these failed dispersers are assumed to not make a difference to patch dynamics, almost like there's a void between these habitats of interest. But what if these individuals can eventually contribute to population growth, even if they're not immediately reproductively viable? This is the central question that will motivate all aspects of my talk today. So now we'll first walk through two objectives and then I'll outline the three hypotheses um, that align with them. So the first objective asks, what are the demographic fates of dispersers that land in unsuitable habitat? So if an individual lands with an unsuitable habitat, as shown here in the gray region, the first demographic fate is death. The second possible fate is that the individual survives, and if it does, it may survive either through staying dormant in the seed stage or germinating into an adult at a cost to its reproduction. And this is called a sink population. So sinks occur when population growth is below replacement, as indicated by lambda is less than one. Sinks can only be maintained by incoming dispersal from persistent populations. And if lambda is over one, this means the population is persistent. So as I go through the talk, keep in mind that transient survival can be achieved through dormancy or sink populations. And it's good to keep in mind that the demographic fate of failed dispersals might differ by the habitat types. So the first habitat I'm investigating, I'll call the pouch habitat. And these specialist communities are broken up in a landscape. They commonly experience dispersal limitation. Patch habitat is a common occurrence in environmentally heterogeneous systems. The second habitat I'll call the matrix. Specialists in this habitat are found continuously through the landscape and are excluded from patches for a variety of reasons, depending on the system. So my second objective asked, can these fates contribute to realized dispersal and invasive survival within patches? So by learning whether transient populations exist in unsuitable habitat won't be sufficient evidence to determine if it's worth considering their contribution to regional patch demographics. We also have to understand whether these transient in individuals are likely to disperse through unsuitable habitat over time, eventually ending up in suitable habitat and thereby contributing to persistent population dynamics. So in one data collection year, I could not fully test this second objective, but I look for evidence of connections between transient and persistent populations within one generation by examining how the distribution of transient populations are extended or hindered by species characteristics and dispersal vectors. And so this supports the possibility that dormant seeds could eventually lead to realized dispersal along some corridors, but not others. So for example, gravity dispersed seeds can move farther downhill than uphill effectively stretching their dispersal kernel. Whereas we wouldn't expect an extended dispersal kernel of gravity dispersed seeds along animal paths. So overall, the eventual fate of failed dispersers in either direction depends on how the community is made up of species with different dispersal strategies as they interact with dispersal vectors. So to address my two objectives, I broke my research into three hypotheses. First, as patch specialists disperse into the matrix. I hypothesize they will persist as dormant seeds. 
Then I hypothesize that these transients could contribute to realized dispersal if their movement out of patches can be extended by certain dispersal vectors interacting with seed strategies, a footprint of dormant seed dispersal. Finally, as a matrix invader disperses into the patches, I predict it will persist as sink populations, thereby transiently invading patches. So I worked in the serpentine grasslands of North California, and the, these serpentine patches are roughly outlined in yellow. Um, they're insular, whereas the invaded matrix habitat is continuous. Across each patch habitat boundary, I sampled paired adjacent plots moving from one habitat type into the other to compare two transient survival methods, seed banks and adult germination. The seed bank consisted of all seeds that were viable. As we later germinated them in gibberellic acid to determine their identity and abundance. So by sampling these paired plots for adults and seeds, we can compare species identity and abundance in unsuitable habitat between these two life stages, seeds and adults, thereby identifying the demographic fates of patch species into matrix and matrix species into patches. So as I had outlined, one fate of landing in the matrix could be dormancy. Waiting for better conditions through time is well studied. However, a recent um, a body of literature has started to explore the possibility of dispersing dormant seeds with implications for patch connectivity. So in this case, specialists find the matrix habitat unsuitable and would be triggered to go dormant. So we predict that if seed banks do not maintain patch species richness or total abundance into the matrix, then we would find no difference between adult and seed bank richness or abundance as indicated by these parallel lines. But if seed banks can enhance patch species survival into the matrix, then we should see a decline in richness and abundance into the matrix that's more pronounced for the adult community than for the seed bank. And this would indicate that more seeds than adults are able to survive into the matrix as seeds go dormant and adults fail to germinate. So I found that seed banks are retaining abundance as I had expected. So on the figure from the dashed edge to the matrix on the right, we see that the blue seed bank retains more of its abundance than the red adult line. And this means that patch specialists persist in the matrix in proportionally higher abundances as seeds. However, for species richness, since the slope of both lines here decline in parallel as we move into the matrix, species richness doesn't differ between the adults and the seed bank. And this indicates that dormancy is not facilitating transient survival of many more species in unsuitable habitat than the patch specialist adults. So dormancy only facilitates a higher abundance of each species survival in unsuitable habitat. Note, though, that in both the abundance and the richness figures, we find that adults are still persisting in the matrix, which is contrary to what we would have anticipated. So because abundance showed the expected pattern, I conclude that dormant life stages maintain transient populations of patch species into unsuitable habitat to some degree. However, I did not find the expected pattern for species richness, as there are more adults in the matrix than I predicted. And the limitation of my methods is that I don't know the seed production on these adults, so I cannot infer their influence on connectivity. But I'll come back to that point. So, so far we've confirmed that patch um, communities exist as dormant seeds in the matrix. However, this doesn't provide any evidence that they matter to the meta population dynamics or community dynamics. So to address the snapshot of whether dormant seeds move, I tested the hypothesis that certain seed types disperse farther away when they occur along certain dispersal vectors. So I took a community approach to determining the likelihood that seed banks accumulate in the matrix based on seed types called dispersal syndromes. And the three most common syndromes in my system um, were short distance dispersers, animal dispersers, and wind dispersers. And I expect that the short distance dispersers would accumulate more with downhill transects, and that animal dispersed seeds would accumulate along animal paths. And finally, that wind dispersed seeds would not actually differ in their accumulation, as they are lightweight with long dispersal distances, often longer than my 20 meter sampling. So contrary to my predictions, seed accumulation on the whole did not align to different factors, 
Instead, only one dispersal vector explained enough variation in the data to be included in the model. And this was the steepness of hill slopes. So steep slopes enhanced seed bank accumulation, regardless of species dispersal syndrome. This is evidence that landscape features enhance the movement of dormant seeds and increase matrix permeability, regardless of the seed dispersal strategies. And the limitations of my approach here are that I did not track the seeds. Remember, this is my master's work and I had one year to evaluate this in the field. So as such, these patterns represent a snapshot in time. Yet these short-term results motivate future long-term studies into the importance of landscape characteristics for connections between transient and persistent populations. And one specific future direction I wanna quickly outline um, is that we could see how the movement of dormant seeds with slope might facilitate stepping stone connectivity. So stepping stones are where there are a few adults capable of germinating in the matrix and reproducing. Then those seeds are dispersed a bit further until seeds reach suitable patches of habitat a number of generations later. So recall that earlier I found more adult patch specialists in the matrix than I would have expected. So connections between these patches could be accelerated through stepping stone dispersal if they are also abundant seed banks there. So future work could look at the time to connectivity comparing stepping stone demography with a concurrent seed bank and without one. So now we'll move through my final hypothesis. Um, from the matrix specialist perspective, the patches are unsuitable here. So even though we wouldn't expect one invasive individual with a low reproductive output to competitively disadvantage the patch communities, if many sink individuals can transiently exist in patches, then the invasives could have a competitive impact on patch specialists, even if that's just taking up space. So to look at this, we focused on a dominant invader species, which is the Avena fatua, a wild oat, to explore the consequences of failed dispersal from the matrix into the patches. So if Avena persist as sink populations as they cross into patches, we would expect that seeds landing there would either germinate or die, as past literature suggested that dormancy was unlikely in this species. So due to this germination response, we'd see many individuals present as adult and not many present as seeds, which is the opposite of what I had predicted and found for patch specialists. So an advantage of focusing on only one dominant matrix species is that I could feasibly record their seed production, which tells us whether the avena crossing this habitat boundary make up sink, which are transient populations, or source being persistent populations. So in sinks, Adult reproduction should necessarily be below replacement within the patches, whereas seed production here indicated by lambda is less than one. And you can see that populations that re reproduce at replacement are indicated by the dashed lambda equals one line. So I found that there is a large decline in seed abundance in patches, which are on the left, compared to the matrix on the right, as I expected. But there's also a huge decline in adult abundance, which is the orange line. So in these orange dots, these adults that persist in the patches, on the right, we can see that they reproduce at replacement, such that any mortality would drive that population below replacement. And this actually confirms my prediction that they exist as sinks, though much more rarely than I had anticipated. Small population sizes mean that these populations are especially vulnerable to extinction, even as a small disturbance or change in conditions would have amplified effects on their demography. So based on how few avena I recorded within patches all across the study system, I expected the regional effect of this dominant invasive sink population on the patch diversity to be pretty negligible. So now that we've gone through each hypothesis, let's go back to those two main objectives. The first being, what are the demographic fates of dispersers that land in unsuitable habitat? Well, I've established that transient populations can exist in both unsuitable habitats and do so in different ways and in different abundances depending on the habitat type. Second, do these fates contribute to realized dispersal and invasion into patches? Well, we've learned that steep slopes can extend dispersal kernels and may connect dormant populations to persistent populations through stepping stones or secondary seed movement. Uh, seed movement. 
But these speculations definitely require uh, targeted study over multiple years. But in terms of invasion, transient in Venus sinks occur so rarely that it's really unlikely that they contribute to patch invasion. So with that, um, I'd like to thank um, all of the people who've helped me in this research in these two years at UBC. This would not have been possible without my awesome advisor, Rachel Germain, my lab at UBC, um, my master's committees, really helpful comments, and the California Native Plant Society for supporting my work. And I want to thank you all for listening, despite this uh, novel format. <laughs> and um, I look forward to any. OK, thank you, Megan, for that talk. Uh, Megan is here to answer questions. So please let us know if you have any for her. Nope, oh, there's one on Slack. Yeah, so a question from Peter. Um, do you have a guess of how strong the downhill bias is and how much it might vary by species? So is this just a Novena thing or is this likely to be variable between different species? For sure, yeah, that's a good question, thanks. Um, definitely there's like a spatial aspect to how different that will be. Um, we just happen to be working on a like very um, topologically variable um, space. So certainly in some patches, it will matter more than others. And as far as species goes, um, originally that's why I tried to um, change them into different dispersal syndromes, because I thought that rounder seeds, heavier seeds, larger seeds might actually be able to go farther downhill um, than something that's more like oblong, um, like a animal dispersed seed or something like that. So I expect there's still probably small amounts of variation between dispersal syndromes and how they react to the slope, but um, we didn't tease that apart because it was definitely a post hoc finding. So worth looking into, and I'm sure on, along the same lines, there's um, water drainage areas in this system as well. So some seeds would probably be carried farther by um, water events and stuff like that. Great, another question from Nick. Dormancy is one way to disperse in time. Do you know what the temporal variability in patch suitability is? That's a good question too. I am in the midst of getting data about this actually for a completely different project, um, but I'm hoping to get imagery to kind of assess on a patch to patch basis how different their productivity is. Um, and hopefully that will give us insights about that. But they can be quite variable, I know that. And um, also in a related project that Rachel and a collaborator, um, Kelly Sliman are working on, um, really look at how those patches with the high productivity have much more potential to be variable through time than the very harsh sites. And I do have to say the sites that I worked with here are definitely on the harsher end if you look at the entire spectrum of my system. So probably not as much if you look at the whole picture. Great. Um, if anyone has a quick question at the end. Jeanette's question was kind of the same as Nick's, so great minds think alike there, I guess. Hmm. Um, yeah, uh, well, we're pretty close to the time for the next talk anyway, so I think we can say thank you, Megan, for a wonderful and um, I'll hand it back over to Jeanette. Thanks. Awesome. Um, I just want to encourage everyone to, to keep those questions coming in the chat. Um, one, one cool thing about being in this venue is that it definitely lowers the stress threshold for posing questions. And so get your first question ever in there if you have not done that yet. Great opportunity. Um, our next speaker is Jeremy Yoder, and uh, Jeremy is, uh, whoops, 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 I'm sorry, the lines here, is going to talk to us about plant associate interactions and population genetic structure across trophic levels. Off to you, Jeremy. All right, uh, yeah, thanks, Jeanette. Jeanette. Um, let me see if I can get screen sharing working.
And oh, oh, sorry. Thought I had that desktop. Okay, I think this is the correct one. <laughs> Do I have? Yep. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, I haven't I haven't done enough uh, dual screen sharing, I guess. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, thanks again. Um, I'm uh, going to be talking a little bit about uh, talking today about a project that I've been working on with uh, the grad students in my lab as sort of a sort of a side project of theirs. Um, uh, and, but this starts basically from uh, the place that that most of my research does, which is um, the, the the conclusion of the origin of species, of course. Um, an image that we we return to a lot is uh, the entangled bank in this in this paragraph. Um, where Darwin talks about uh, the diversity of life in a particular in a particular place and the many interactions among the species that coexist there, um, and the that's always been um, an inspiration to me because it it it's a starting point for for the uh, the importance of uh, interactions among living things and the it nods toward the fact that uh, biodiversity in some sense helps to create more biodiversity. Um, and I think since since the origin, we've we've collected a lot of um, reasons to think that that this is the case that interactions among species um, help to to promote diversity. Um, just in the last year, uh, um, I was lucky to contribute to a paper uh, at, in AMNAT uh, where we put together um, a bunch of uh, collected a bunch of data from um, local adaptation experiments and found that uh, biotic sources of local adaptation have uh, somewhat stronger fitness effects than abiotic sources like climate, uh, the, the kinds of environments that can't evolve in response to, uh, to the evolutionary changes uh, of local adaptation. Um, and this it was actually published in the same issue with another paper. Um, this is data from, from ours, uh, but both of, both of these uh, used slightly different ways to compile the data and came up with different data sets. But found um, stronger effects of stronger biotic effects in the tropics, and uh, so that we're starting to get um, evidence in evidence supporting a, a longstanding idea that that biodiversity in the tropics may be may be related to uh, more uh, evolution uh, among species competition, uh, but also antagonisms, mutualisms. Um, there's more diversity. There's more sources of coevolution. Um, more sources of, of biotic selection. Um, we also have classic indirect evidence uh, that interaction with um, with other other living things is related to uh, broad scale evolutionary diversification. This is from a um, a pretty foundational paper at this point that that demonstrated that uh, clades of weevils that feed on uh, live angiosperm tissue, which, which uh, can respond in ways that, um, that uh, dead tissue can't versus uh, dead tissue or gymnosperms, those, uh, those clades were more, uh, more diverse than comparable sister clades. Um, and we've also, we've also built up a, a, a whole literature comparing um, the phylogenetic structure of uh, groups of interacting species, uh, especially um, plants and associated species. And often we find uh, patterns of phylogenetic congruence that are consistent with um, shared evolutionary history and possibly uh, evolution between these, these groups. Um, and this, this can even be the case where, when we we think that these are not happening, the, the co-evolution or the, the diversification is not happening, happening simultaneously. So the, that weevil example, later data has, has established that um, the diversification of the weevils uh, pre, post-dates um, the point at which 
uh, angiosperms are the, the dominant plants uh, in terrestrial ecosystems. So we had the diversification of the angiosperms and then we had the diverse, diversification of weevils. Um, but uh, so the fact that they're not happening simultaneously tells us something about what kinds of processes might be causing those patterns. Um, but it doesn't mean that, that the interaction isn't important. And angiosperms, plants uh, in general, are the foundations of um, terrestrial ecosystems. So they're, they're really a, a case where we, we, can, we expect that they could be exerting um, diversifying, uh, diversifying selection upwards through, uh, through trophic levels. Um, and the point at which this really, uh, the process that we, that, uh, the processes at which these patterns um, would really start to emerge is at the, uh, the level of local adaptation across, across landscapes, across, among, um, across metapopulations. Uh, so this is, where, this is where we're getting into concepts that we've already seen in this, in this session. Um, if adaptation to plants promotes diversification, we should see that uh, at the population genetic level. And we would expect that local adaptation of associated species to the plants that they're associated with should create ecological isolation so that plants and their associates should have parallel population structures. Uh, uh, but these are not the only, the only forces that we know of in, in population genetics that can, can create these patterns, right? Um, plants and their associates are also subject to isolation by distance. And so you have uh, two species that are interacting with each other across a landscape. If they have similar dispersal and vicariance, they might have similar population structures just as a consequence of isolation by distance. Um, and if they're experiencing um, the broader environment, the abiotic environment uh, in similar ways, uh, they may be locally adapted to that and uh, developing parallel population structures without necessarily um, uh, co-adapting themselves. So we've also, so we've got at least two additional reasons that the, these patterns might emerge. Uh, but we can imagine data sets that might let us start to pick these, pick these apart. And actually, um, I've, I collected one uh, something like 15 years ago now. Um, this is some reanalysis of data from my, from my PhD um, comparing genetic distance in uh, a pollinating yucca moth and genetic distances in, in Joshua trees, Western Joshua trees specifically. Um, and so we can, we can uh, estimate pairwise genetic dis distances between populations for both species. Um, we can uh, come up with a, an estimate of climate difference, uh, take the principal components analysis of climates at the, the sites of collections and uh, just do Euclidean distance uh, between sites within that PC sp PCA space. Um, and then also finally compare genetic distances for the two interacting species. And what we see with, with this data set, which, is, which seems very tidy to me, is uh, while the trees have uh, significant isolation by distance and significant isolation by climate, um, the, the moths don't show either of those patterns, but then they do show uh, correlation of genetic distances with uh, the trees. So it looks to, it looks to me from, from this uh, first pass here, the associated species, the moths, are uh, ecologically isolated um, by their association with, with Joshua trees. And so having, having basically started my scientific career with this, this kind of question, um, more recently, I, I've been thinking about, you know, what, how broad or how many kinds of data, how many, how many examples of this kind of data set are there out there? And so I've been working with um, the grad students in, in my lab, uh, Alby Dang, Kate McGregor, and Mikhail Plaz to uh, compile public published data sets that have these basic building blocks for for looking at these patterns, um, looking for cases where folks have published genetic distances for populations of a plant and corresponding populations of some associated species. So we need two data sets in the same in the same paper, um, and then. Uh, Geographic locations, ideally, because that lets us go back and get and get the climate data as well. But in a pinch, we'll just take uh, geographic distances between between sampling sites, um, and 
over the last over the last year or so, we've actually come up with a, a pretty respectable uh, data set. Um, I, when I sat down to to put this put this slide together, I wasn't quite sure I would fit everything on one um, on one slide. But what these are all of the plant species uh, and all of the associate species that we've we've found appropriate data for at this point. Um, and you can see we've got a pretty broad uh, taxonomic diversity of plants anyway. But there's they're, they're overwhelmingly uh, insect associates. We've got one microbial example from a from a, um, Medicago uh, lupulina, black medic, um, uh, one uh, parasitic plant, uh, Arsithobium americanum, on two different two different pine species, um, and so uh, so putting this all together, uh, we've got uh, thirteen papers that we've that we've found um, presenting data from uh, seventeen plant associate pairs, and some of those papers are presenting multiple pairs. Uh, five of the associations are antagonistic, so herbivores or parasites. Uh, the, the larger set are mutualistic, um, and that maybe isn't surprising given what kinds of associations you might expect people to, to even think to collect this data for. Uh, there are 15 unique plants involved and 16 unique associate taxa, um, and again, overwhelmingly insects. The data types are uh, pretty pretty variable, but most uh, the most common uh, form of genetic data used is uh, microsatellite data, uh, which um, that again makes sense when we're talking about collecting genetic data in two uh, fairly different taxa, right? A plant and some uh, some animal or or microbe. Um, uh, and, the the uh, the rate of publication of these data sets is increasing. So more than half of these half of these papers have come out in the last uh, just in the last decade. Um, and what we can what we what we were able to do is uh, um, compile the data into into common formats and then do the same kinds of analysis across all of these data sets. Right. So we can start uh, making comparisons where uh, the the analysis choices don't make don't make a difference in the overall patterns that we're seeing. Um, so this is uh, the Spearman rank correlation between uh, geographic distance and genetic distance for plants and associates in each of these each of these plant associate pairs. Uh, and the the confidence intervals that I've put on these are based on bootstrapping because we're working with uh, very non-normal um, autocorrelated, spatially autocorrelated data, right? Um, so uh, Ran, um, non parametric methods are what we're what we're going to have to use for that. Uh, so this is the isolation by distance pattern. You can see we've got a lot of variation in um, whether we see significant isolation by distance uh, and how how confident we are in that. Um, here's isolation by climate. And then here is that plant associate correlation. Um, and Rather than make you make you stare at all of the the uh, confidence intervals here, I'll just total up uh, what we have for for significance at, at um, a p value small enough to be robust to the multiple testing here. Um, we see isolation by distance in about half of the plants uh, and about a third of the associates. Um, isolation by climate in uh, smaller numbers, but sort of a similar ratio. And about a third of the cases we see a correlation and genetic distances between the plants and associates. Um, we can also uh, put that together in a, um, um, a meta-analytic framework where we are summarizing all of these correlations across all of the studies um, and estimating a confidence interval uh, after weighting everything based on sample size and uh, the uh, variation in the individual data sets. And if we do that, we see uh, significantly non-zero correlations for all of these different levels for both the plants and associates. Uh, but this is not really getting at the, the fundamental issue, right? Still, we've got um, all of these spatially autocorrelated uh, statistics, which are collinear with each other. Um, really what we wanna know is, is there a correlation between plants and associates after we control for uh, the isolation by climate and the isolation by distance? And so to do that, um, 
I've used uh, Bayesian regression modeling, uh, which uh, allows a lot of flexibility in terms of the, the distributions we expect um, to fit models that predict associate genetic distance with each of these different dist distances. Um, and then we can compare the posterior estimates of the regression coefficients for each of these different uh, different terms. And so now we're going, now we're getting um, the same kinds of comparisons I was doing before, but we're not just looking at pairwise correlations between these, these different ex, uh, explanatory variables. We're looking at um, a single model that incorporates everything. And this looks, uh, this looks quite a bit different from what we see uh, for just the correlations. Um, and again, we've got some cases where there are there the data the original data is uh, messy enough, or the sample size is small enough that there are very wide confidence intervals on these um, these estimates. But if we if we actually um, highlight what does significantly uh, get away from zero, we've got um, about a third of the about a third of the uh, cases where the associate shows significant isolation by distance. Oh, thank you. Um, and another about a third where there's a, a significant association or a associate isolation by um, plant genetics. And uh, the bulk of those cases, we actually have isolation by uh, plant genetics or isolation by association to the plant that is not uh, matched by isolation by distance um, within, the, within this model that is incorporating all of these terms. Um, so these may be, may be good cases for ecological isolation. Um, um, so what do, we, what do we think we have out of all of this? Well, we'd really like more data. Um, as I said, looks like publication of this kind of data set is increasing. They're getting, they're getting more common and certainly we're getting methods that make them easier to collect. Um, there's some real taxonomic biases in even with what we've got so far, lots of lots of insects, surprisingly few microbes. Um, uh, spatial correlations are common, uh, but controlling for all of that reduces those, those numbers quite a bit. Um, and we do see cases of isolation by host plant without isolation by distance, which are consistent with plant associate uh, coevolution maybe, or with uh, just one-sided local adaptation to plants. Um, so we're, we're still uh, working, on, working on writing this up and um, I'm, we're at a point where uh, other suggestions for, for analysis would be ap appreciated, uh, but there's a preprint in the pipeline at uh, sometime soon, we hope. And so I wanna thank uh, Albie, Kate, and Mikhail again for, for help with this project uh, and for the time they put in on, on lit searching and data extraction. Um, the Yoder Lab is uh, supported by uh, startup funds at CSUN, but also now by the National Science Foundation and Revive and Restore. And I'll just say right at the end here that in connection with that, I'm gonna be uh, recruiting a postdoc in uh, within the next few months. Uh, so that is something to, to look for from, uh, from CSUN, but also if, uh, if you think you might be interested in something like that, get in touch with me. Um, I'll be happy to talk about, uh, about what the timing for that is and, and what we've got to do. Um, and so do I have, have I run against, I haven't run over time. <laughs> yeah, um, I think I we can, will time for questions. not have really much time for questions unless anyone can phrase one extremely concisely. Um, it, yeah, Jeremy, I think if you could answer the questions in the chat, that would be best so we don't run over for the next talk. Oh, sure. Uh, I don't have the chat up from this. Let me just, there we go. Oh, uh, and thank you for your talk. And I can hand it back to Jeanette. Yeah, we'll, we'll right. let you type answers. OK, Jeremy? Sounds good. All right, thanks. Mm. Um, thanks for your talk. Um, OK, so our next speaker is uh, Nitin Ravikanthachari, um, who is going to be talking to us about the role of migration selection balance in the persistence of maladaptation in a specialist plant herbivore interaction. So Nitin, off to you. And you might be muted. Yeah, uh, am I audible now? Yes. Okay, uh, and is my screen up? 
It's up, but it's not in full screen yet. Okay. Okay, cool. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Nitin, and I'm a third year graduate student at the Uni of, University of South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And today I'll be talking about the first chapter of my thesis, which uh, looks at understanding why persistent maladaptation uh, can occur in a specialist uh, plant herbivore interaction. So uh, local adaptation occurs when organisms evolve adaptively in response to strong spatially heterogeneous selection. And local adaptation is usually measured through reciprocal transplant experiments. And in uh, reciprocal transplant experiments, one would expect the fitness of a locally adapted population or an individual to be higher at its native site compared to any other uh, population or indiv individual at that same site. Although a lot of people or uh, although a lot of research has been done on uh, local adaptation and people think may think that local adaptation is the norm, there are many instances where maladaptation occurs in, uh, where maladaptation of populations or individuals can occur in their native habitat. There are many reasons as to what can cause these maladaptations. And I'll be talking about one specific cause that is uh, uh, evolutionary traps. So what are evolutionary traps? So evolutionary traps are any resources which, which have a low fitness value, but is attractive to an organism, even if other resources are available. So if you plot the preference of a trait against the fitness value of its response, the black line here represents the optimal uh, uh, preference, and you would expect organisms to fall somewhere between, uh, in, somewhere in the green circle, which would be the expected preference. But evolutionary traps occur when you have a high preference for a low fitness value trait. And a lot of research has been done as to how evolutionary traps are formed and how organisms can uh, escape from these evolutionary traps. But not a lot of research has been done as to why uh, evolutionary traps can persist or how evolutionary traps can persist and what are the consequences of that. And I'd be, I will be talking about one such uh, persistent evolutionary trap between a herbivore and an exotic plant. The herbivore that I'll be talking about is, uh, I'll be addressing today is uh, known as Paris Magdanui. It's a butterfly uh, uh, distributed in the Rocky Mountains. It is specialized to feed on a uh, Brassicaceae uh, plant family, which is the mustard plant family. And the females use uh, um, glucosinolates, that is a chemical compound, which are specific to mustard plants to, ovip to ovip oviposit. And the larvae feed on a lot of uh, native uh, mustard plants, which are present in the Rocky Mountains. These butterflies are univoltine and they fly between June and August. The, the exotic plant that, I'm, uh, that I'll be addressing today is known as Class B arvency or the field penicress. This is a mustard uh, plant and this contains glucosinolates like a lot of other mustard, mustard plants. But this plant is native to temperate Eurasia and it is used as a host plant by Pyrus napi, which is present in Eurasia. And Paris napi is a sister species to Paris mectanoe. This plant was introduced to our field site, the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory, sometime in 1870s. And this plant is again distributed patchily in the landscape, and it does not occur over uh, uh, after a certain elevation. And the females of Paris mectanoe recognize this as a host plant due to Q similarity with native host plants, and they lay eggs on it. However, when uh, all the larvae which develop on it die, thus leading to an evolutionary trap. So the first question that came to me when I, when I started working with the system as to why the butterflies have not evolved to either avoid these plants or adapt, or adapt to feed on this plant even after at least 140 years of uh, you know, interacting with the plant. And one of the reasons, one of the things that I could think of uh, was, to, uh, was that migration from areas where the plant was not present into areas where the plant was present could be you know, affecting local adaptation and thus uh, leading to the solutionary trap to be persistent. So how does uh, migration selection, migration and selection interplay with local adaptation either in a temporally stable environment or a temporally fluctuating environment? So uh, uh, the points here represent the differences in the fitness between local uh, and the migrant individuals. So in a temporarily stable environment, you would expect local adaptation to occur when migration is low. And 
you would expect local adaptation to drastically reduce as migration rate increases. Whereas in temporarily fluctuating environment, you would expect local adaptation to occur at intermediate migration rates. And this is because when you have intermediate migration rates, uh, the, amount, uh, the amount of standing gen genetic variation increases, thus helping uh, organisms to respond adaptive, adapt adaptively to fluctuating environments. So given this background, what uh, these were, what our hypothesis were. So the first hypothesis that we had was that either, uh, you know, in a stable environment, high rate of gene flow or a low rate or a high rate of gene flow in a fluctuating environment may be contributing to the persistence of these maladaptation. And to do that, we tested, uh, the, we, we want to test the population structure of Paris McDenouille in the East River Valley. And we also wanted to see what the migration rates were in sites with the plant and sites without the plant. And secondly, we wanted to see, we thought that uh, low genetic variation and differentiation between sites might be leading to low standing genetic variation thus contributing to persistent maladaptation. So to do that, uh, to test that, what we uh, did was we wanted to uh, uh, look at the underlying genetic differentiation between sites which had the plant or the sites which did not have the plant. And lastly, we hypothesized that there could be weak or no selection that might be leading to the persistence of maladaptation. And to test this, we wanted to see if there were any signatures of local adaptations in sites which had the plant. So this is the overview of what, how we went about doing it. So we uh, did whole genome sequencing of 286 individuals from around 12 sites. And we've used uh, 192 in this analysis after filtering through the GATK pipeline. And uh, to look at po population structure, we used admixture and PCAs. And we used uh, uh, EEMS, which is the effect, uh, effective, so estimated effective migration surface to estimate migration in the East River Valley. So the EMS method does not infer absolute migration rates, but rather identifies regions which, uh, which have either low or high uh, gene flow relative to a simple two-dimensional stepping stone isolation model uh, and isolation by distance model. And it also helps us to identify regions receiving either limited dispersal or gene flow. And that was our uh, goal to see if what areas had low gene flow versus what areas had higher gene flows. And then we wanted to see if there were any uh, uh, genome-wide, uh, you know, signatures of demographic changes and selection. So we uh, used Tajima's T to calculate that using VCF tools and uh, with a sliding window approach. And we used VCF, uh, so we, we used VCF tools to calculate FSTs. And we did our association analysis using BayPass to identify loci which were under selection or associated with the presence of class B. And this is what our results indicated that all sites in the East River Valley compose, uh, comprise of a single population. We did not find any clustering of, our, uh, of, any, of, of, uh, any, of any of the sites and all of them uh, just uh, uh, fell into a single cluster. We tested this with rare, uh, rare alleles. We tested this with uh, sex chromosome alone and we also tested this with across the genome and all of them uh, turned out uh, turned up the same pattern. So this kind of tells us that there is, uh, the whole landscape is just made of a single, uh, admixed population. And with our uh, migration surface, what we found was that sites with class B r c have average migration rates, whereas sites without class B have slightly higher than average migration rates. So EMS just uh, estimates, uh, sorry, yeah. EMS estimates if, uh, uh, if a site has higher or lower migration depending upon genetic dissimilarity indexes. And what we see here is that the majority of the landscape has average migration and uh, there are some sites which have slightly higher than average migration. And although we do not know the absolute uh, rate of average migration or what the absolute, uh, you know, what the quantity, what the value of the average migration rate is, we think it is not zero because of what we found with our FST result, which I'll be sharing in the next slide. So for our FST analysis, we did three types of comparison. So the first type of comparison was between the two furthest sites. And the second type of comparison was between uh, the uh, site in the middle with either of the uh, two extreme sites. And the third comparison was where we group uh, sites with class B and sites without class B separately and did a, a pairwise comparison of FST across the genome. 
So with our FST analysis, what we found was that overall there is no difference, uh, no genetic differentiation with e any of the pairwise comparisons that we did. But however, there were a few sites or few loci which exhibited higher differentiation. And this is consistent with uh, local adaptation or you know, signatures of uh, adaptation or selection uh, under gene flow. And uh, all of these uh, uh, significant outlier loci were located on these five chromosomes. So we wanted to test further if these five chromosomes or the loci on these chromosomes were indeed associated with uh, the presence of class P or not. So, uh, and uh, with our Tajima's D, we did uh, three different types of comparisons. The first one is where we uh, compared Tajima across all the individuals, pulling them into, an, into a single sample, into a single group, sorry. And then the second one was just where we uh, used, uh, where we used uh, sites without LASP and the third one was sites with LASP. And what we found with Tajima is that overall there is a positive Tajima value in the, uh, in the, across the genome. So that's indicating that the population is either contracting or it's going through a bottleneck. And uh, we still want to see, I mean, we want to do further tests to see if, to try to identify what it is exactly. However, there were a few uh, uh, loci which had lower negative uh, Tajima D values that is negative uh, Tajima D values. And these could sometimes, you know, uh, uh, these could indicate uh, positive selection, but we did not find, uh, we think that this could be weak positive selection because the values were not uh, too high. And these uh, uh, negative values were again uh, overlapping with the same chromosomes that we found with uh, out significant outlier lo uh, loci in the FST analysis. So given these two uh, uh, data uh, uh, results, what we wanted to see was if these were indeed associated with uh, class P presence or not. So we did a BPAS analysis, which looks at, uh, uh, which can identify genetic markers associated with selection or with any specific population covariates. And what we found with our BPAS is that we found 18 SNPs which were under selection and we used an annotated genome to identify these uh, genes. And what we, uh, out of the 18 uh, uh, genes that were under selection, four of them are directly related to host plant detection or metabolism. Of the four, two of them are gustatory receptors. The first one is a defective proboscis extension factor and the other one is a autopetrin. Both of these are essential for host plant uh, detection by females as well as larval feeding. And the other one uh, which we found was significantly, uh, which we think is associated with, uh, uh, could be associated with class P is the DNA RNA nonspecific endonuclease. This gene has a lot of functions and one of them is in uh, digestion. And this uh, gene is highly expressed in the Midgard of larvae. So we think that this could also be associated with uh, class P RNC. And finally, we also found one gene which was on odorant receptor, which is helpful in uh, host plant sensing by females. Along with these, we also found a few more genes which could be uh, related to larval development, such as the juvenile hormone and the insect cuticular protein. But we're not sure if uh, we can attribute that to uh, uh, presence of class P. So, what do all what do the results overall tell us? So the results tell us that there is no differentiation uh, in of uh, P uh, of Paris McDonough in the East River Valley, indicating that there is gene flow among sites. And our migration analysis also says the same thing that sites with class P have average migration. So there is, uh, and the sites without have a slightly mar uh, marginally higher migration rates, but there is no depressed migration in any of the sites. So that again reiterates that there is gene flow among all the sites. And that uh, sites with low, uh, with or without class P similarly have low genetic differentiation, but there are few loci which show patterns of high divergence. And uh, our association analysis again confirmed that there is signatures of selection response to presence of class P RNC. So given this, we were still puzzled as to why there is no local adaptation occurring, even if there is a, a selection going on. And we think that it could be because that class P may represent a temporarily stable habitat and any sort of gene flow might be dampening local adaptation. Or it could be that uh, the maladaptation could also be, along with migration, could uh, the other factors that could be contributing would be evolutionary constraints, such as 
retained preference for ancestral host because uh, of what Paris Napi and Paris McDonough uh, feed on, or it could be because of rapid uh, environmental fluctuations, which could be superseding the rate of adaptation or the lack of standing genetic variation. We also estimated nucleotide diversity across the genome using a sliding window up, uh, 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 approach, but we are not sure of our results yet because we did not use invariant sites. But whatever results we have gotten, it shows that there is a very low genetic variation. But once we finish our analysis with this uh, invariant site, we'll be more sure of if there is any standing genetic variation or not. And finally, what we think we sh what we think we should be doing after you know from these results of moving on is to quantify gene flow firstly, and then also quantify preference of uh, quantify preference of class P RNC in different sites along with trying to identify what the genetic basis for OE position is and also level performances. And I think this will help us identify what the uh, mechanistic cause of persistent maladaptation in the system is. And I'd like to thank my thesis committee for all their help and uh, the people who helped me collect data and analyze this uh, data set. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Nitin, for a really lovely talk. Um, people feel free to drop questions in the chat. Um, I wanted to say, I think this is a great talk for ASN. I'm a Rumble alumna as well, and I had no idea this really cool ecological trap was happening right in the meadows where I worked at one point. Um, so I guess one question I had, did you, and you might have covered this, so sorry if you did and I missed it, um, but, what do you know about population densities in the sites with and without FLASB? And is that potentially contributing to your findings about migration rates between uh, those two types of sites? So uh, I think the population density is very year to year. So, uh, so for example, a lot of the sites that the previous PhD, uh, previous GAT student measured or collected or did our experiments in, I could not find any butterflies when I did my first field season in 2019. So I think the population densities keep fluctuating, but uh, so I think that could also be contributing to it. So we'll have to just, uh, I mean, the other thing that I was also thinking of doing was to repeat the analysis uh, across years to see how it varies across years. So we'll get an idea of how population densities and actually be affecting these as well. Great. Um, if anyone else has questions, please. Uh, yeah, type them out either in the Slack or on Zoom. Um, okay, we have one from Jeanette. Uh, she is wondering about the pinch points in the life history of the moth. Um, can you please repeat the question? Um, the question is, I was wondering about the pinch points in the life history of the moth. So in other words, yeah. in other words I'm just wondering um, how effective selection is at that life history, at that early life history stage, or if there's a lot of other selection happening at that critical stage, even when your invader plant isn't present. Yeah, I think, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, in terms of, in early stages of uh, uh, butterflies and moths, I think the biggest uh, 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 pressure would be with parasitoids and predators. So it could be that uh, there might not be too much selection occurring at this. Uh, uh, I mean, there might not be as strong a selection as what the pre parasitoids or predators might be imposing. But I think when uh, the lab measured its selection in 2000, it was around 3%. And, and I think that is significant selection enough. So I'm, I mean, yeah. It, could be one of the other sele uh, selective forces shaping uh, the population dynamics, but yeah, I mean, I'm yeah, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm sure that parasitoids and um, predators might be play a much uh, more important role. I'm not sure if I answered your question with that. That's great. Thanks. Um, there's one more question in the chat that maybe you could look at and type out an answer to just so we stay on time and can move on to our next speaker. But thanks a lot for a great talk. Um, our next talk is by uh, Nikunj uh, Goel. And uh, it's going to be
presented as a recorded talk, but Nick Winge is also here and ready to answer questions at the at the um, at the conclusion of the recording. Um, and uh, yeah, the recorded talks always include the title, so I'll just let the recording uh, play. Hello, my name is Nick Winge. Uh, I'm a second year graduate student at Department of Integrative Biology at University of Texas, Austin. Uh, broadly, I'm interested in dispersal biogeography. That is how dispersal maintains distribution of biota. Uh, and today I'm going to discuss how dispersal maintains range limits. Historically, biogeographers have argued that species distribution is determined by biophysical constraints on species growth, such that the range limit is determined by environmental conditions for which the species overall growth rate is zero. This environmental condition is commonly referred to as the bioclimatic limit of the species. This idea of environmentally constrained species distribution was mathematically formalized by Hutchinson using the concept of niche. Basically, Hutchinson argued that the species distribution can be inferred by mapping species fundamental niche onto the geographical space. Using this logic, the species range limit can be identified by mapping the surface of the fundamental niche onto the geographical space. However, Hutchinson was quick to note that the fundamental niche may not always match with the realized environmental condition by the species. One possible reason why that might happen is dispersal. For example, if we consider a pair of source and sink patches that differ in habitat quality, migration of individual from source patch can maintain population in sink, which would otherwise go locally extinct. Clearly in this case, there is a mismatch between fundamental and realized niches. Although sourcing dynamics are widely recognized as important determinant of species distribution, many distribution modelers ignore dispersal in practice. Instead, they argue that at broad spatial scales, climate determines the broad outlines of species distribution, while dispersal only operates at small length scales like one hectare plot. The theoretical justification for this approximation was given by Schmida and Wilson in their 1985 paper. The authors argued that the effects of dispersal should only be discernible at the length scales of species movement. And since the species mean dispersal length scales is typically orders of magnitude smaller than the length scales of distribution, one can neglect, neglect mismatch between bioclimatic and range limit due to sourcing dynamics. However, a careful justification of this claim shows that it may be incorrect. For example, an occupied sink patch near the bioclimatic limit can act as a stepping stone for individuals that migrate to colonize far away sink patches. For example, Kanda and colleagues noted that Virginia possums in central Massachusetts use stepping stone sinks to occupy far away sink patches. This naturally leads us to a question, at what length scales dispersal matter? To address this question, I'm going to consider a reaction diffusion model. A reaction diffusion model consists of three terms. The first term in red describes the rate at which the local population change. This change in population is due to growth of the species in blue and migration of individuals between adjacent patches in purple term. Here we use an exponential growth term, which is dependent on environment as the per capita growth rate. And we use a two dimensional diffusion operator to approximate dispersal. So in this model, the species fundamental niche is given by environmental conditions where the per capita growth rate R is greater than zero. And the realized niche is given by uh, environmental condition where the species intrinsic growth rate is greater than zero. Note that the realized fundamental niche and the funda uh, realized, realized niche and the fundamental niche may not be always equal. So just by looking at this equation, we can draw two conclusions. Let's say the gray line represents the zero growth rate. Consider a sink patch where the environment is bad for species growth. So species should go to extinction in this source patch or uh, in this sink patch. However, 
migration from surrounding patches can compensate for decreasing population to yield a net increase in local growth rate of the population. This corresponds to the case where migration from sources can maintain sink populations. We can also imagine an alternative scenario in which population is locally growing, but migration of individuals drive the local source population to extinction. In this second scenario, we see dispersal can actually drive the source population to local extinction. This is somewhat surprising result as the original formulation of sourcing dynamics by Ronald Pulliam did not consider these demographic consequences of sinks on source patches. Now to formally explain how this, or to formally examine how dispersal affects demography and sourcing patches, I consider a, a two dimensional landscape with a gradient in environment along X axis. The black line in the middle is the bioclimatic limit of the species. I start my analysis with species present at location with environmental conditions corresponding to the fundamental niche. This starting condition means that initially the range limit of the species is aligned with the bioclimatic limit. Since the growth rate at the bioclimatic limit is zero, any change in the population at the range limit is solely due to dispersal flux across the bioclimatic limit. And since the bioclimatic limit has equal number of occupied and unoccupied patches, the influx and the outflux rate cancel each other to yield a net zero dispersal flux at the range limit. Therefore, in the case uh, when the bioclimatic limit is a straight line, the range limit is coincident with the bioclimatic limit. However, dispersal flux will be non-zero if the bioclimatic contours are curved. For example, in the upper half of the plot, the number of unoccupied patches is greater than occupied patches. This will yield a negative dispersal flux at the species boundary. As a result, the range limit, range limit will move backwards. The gray arrow here shows the direction and the magnitude by which the range limit deviates from the bioclimatic limit. Similarly, in the lower half of the plot, the dispersal flux at the bioclimatic limit is positive due to excess of occupied patches. As a result, the range limit will move forward. Here is an animation that I created that shows the species boundary will stable, where the species boundary will stabilize for this particular geometry of bioclimatic limit. Uh, the range limit uh, will eventually equal, equal, stabilize when the sum of immigration and birth is equal to emigration and death. Uh, we can mathematically show that delta E, which is difference in the environment at the range limit and the bioclimatic limit is proportional to the curvature of the bioclimatic limit, which is a measure of how round the bioclimatic limit and, is, and determines the relative influx and outflux of individuals at the species boundary. We also empirically tested this theoretical prediction in the context of savannas and forest. According to the theory that we developed for savannas and forests, we found that the difference between the precipitation at the savanna forest boundary and the bioclimatic limit should be proportional to the curvature. So if we plot the precipitation at the savanna forest boundary as a function of absolute curvature, we should get a V-shaped curve. We found, the savanna, we found that the savanna forest distribution in Africa is consistent with our theoretical prediction. So it seems that there is some evidence that sourcing dynamics may operate on continental scales. In fact, using the model, we can now answer a very fundamental question that is what life history characteristics will lead to significant deviation of species range limit and bioclimatic limit. To do that, we define a new variable E tilde, which is the ratio of environment at the range limit and bioclimatic limit. We can mathematically show that E tilde is equal to one plus minus this additional term that depends upon A tilde. We call this A tilde as non-dimensional area, which is a function of species life history traits and climate. So by looking at this equation, we can see that when A tilde is small, E tilde deviates from one. As a result, the range limit deviates from the bioclimatic limit. So now we can in turn ask for which life histories A tilde is small. Now looking at the expression of A tilde, one can argue that A tilde is small for a highly dispersive species 
with low growth sensitivity to environmental change. Intuitively, what this basically suggests is that if environment is not too bad in sink patches near the bioclimatic limit, migrants from the source patches can maintain population in far away sinks by hopping over intermediate sink patches. And in this way, the effects of dispersal may be substantial at land scales that are far greater than the mean dispersal land scales of the species. These findings have wide implications for biogeography theory. For example, uh, bioclimatic models are often used to draw inferences about the ecological and evolutionary processes that maintain distribution of biota. Uh, these bioclimatic model works in two steps. First, the fundamental niche of the species is estimated using occurrence data, and then this niche, in, niche envelope is reprojected back onto the geographical space, either in the same region at a different time or an entirely different region. Our analysis suggests that for species with fast dispersal and low growth sensitivity, inferences based on these bioclimatic models may be misleading because of two errors. First, bioclimatic models may end up sampling environment from sinks and fail to sample environment, environment from sources. Basically, what this means is that the estimated niche volume may not match with the fundamental niche. Second, even if we could construct the actual niche space using biophysical experiment, when reprojecting the niche space onto geography, the bioclimatic model may fail to predict occupied sinks and empty sources. Uh, from this analysis, we can draw two big conclusions. First, the range limit of the species is not only determined by environment, but also dependent on sourcing dynamics, which are mediated by the geometrical shape of the bioclimatic limit. Second, uh, for species with fast dispersal and low growth sensitivity, sourcing dynamics may be substantial even at large spatial scales. Uh, finally, I want to uh, acknowledge the contribution of my collaborators, lab mates, and colleagues. And I also want to acknowledge uh, funding from University of Texas, Austin. Uh, if you want to know details about this work, uh, you're welcome to go to this bioarchive version of the manuscript. Alternatively, you can also email me and visit my website uh, to see the manuscript. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you for that nice talk. Um, although this was pre recorded, Nikunj is here to answer questions. So there he is. <laughs> um, so please leave your questions in the chat. I'll start with one from Nick, who says this theory presents an interesting hypothesis. Species range boundaries should be smoother than the environmental variables that determine population growth. Do you know of any data consistent with such a pattern? No, uh, I, can't, I can't recall anything off the top of my head. Like, I'm, I'm mostly a theoretician, so I generally don't go in field and collect data, uh, but, but I can look, up, look out for some data sets and see uh, if this pattern is all true. If I can jump in here. It seems that in principle, all the data is available from these kind of um, climate niche models, right? Because the inputs that people have on there are, you know, occupancy, you know, is the species there or is it not? So the range limit is there and you can get some geometry of that. And then they also have abiotic climate variables. And so you can get the geometry of those as well. So you, I think you could um, look at those patterns in principle, Good. which might be an interesting exercise to do. Other questions for Nikunj? I had one which has now slipped my mind. <laughs> um, I guess another one from Nick. Any thoughts on how density dependence muddies the waters? That's a great question. Uh, density dependent doesn't play a big role. So what happens is when you think about range limits, you all like in this framework, you think about uh, when the population density is low. So what you can do is you can linearize the system. And for an exponential model, if you linearize the system, it's the per capita growth rate. But if it's there is density dependence, 
then what you do is you just take the first order derivative of the growth function. Uh, so let's say if you have a logistic growth rate instead of an exponential growth rate, uh, then you take the first order derivative, you still get the per capita growth rate, which is the small r. Uh, so it, th these effects are density independent, or at least the calculations are. I, I think so I can respond to Nick's question. I just thought about it. So yeah, so I, I did. Uh, so we looked at Savannah forest distributions. So Savannah forest distributions, like the mean field models are alternative stable state models, which are a bit different than the exponential growth rate that I considered in this. And in those systems, we kind of found out that if you sort of look at the broad scale geometrical patterns of the Savannah forest boundary, uh, like at least at a very coarse scale, they seem to be consistent with the theory. Uh, whether that pattern is repeatable across continents is something that I have to still look at. Uh, the problem is we've only got one Earth, and so there isn't a lot of uh, continents to go look for savanna forest boundaries. Uh, so. I think another interesting observation is that um, donut shaped uh, distributions at least seem unlikely unless the, the hole in the middle is a um, really, really bad environment, like say like the peak of a mountain range or something like that. Yes, there, what, but there you would also have to consider bias dispersal in some sense, I guess, because topography there also plays a big role. And yeah, I think so. This presentation was very closely related to what Megan had to present, like uh, like like a couple of uh, about an hour ago. So I was looking at her presentation, like, oh, cool. This is exactly it's a great setup. Yeah. So Megan has actually just asked a question in the chat. So um, was your model able to consider how the scale of microsite variability within the fundamental niche matters for the boundary dynamics? No, I didn't do that. Uh, so the, the thing is like this, I think so. Uh, this is a, a very challenging problem at what scales your models are applicable. Uh, it's like, should I consider my models? So it's, it's, it all depends upon, uh, I guess, the assumptions of the model. So the, the reaction diffusion modeling approach is kind of valid uh, when your dispersal land scales over a unit time are much greater than one. So you kind of typically evaluate the typical land scales of dispersal. And if they're much greater than one, then this diffusion approximation seems to be valid. But if it is not, then the interpatch variability at uh, like at microsites would play a big role. And then this model is not a good way to sort of approach that question. Maybe a follow-up question. Um, in in situations like the one Megan is describing, um, what what other approach would you take to try to tackle this? <laughs> so I think so. In that context, I would more mostly build um, local. Locally, I would think of constructing a metapopulation model where I'll consider global dispersal within patches, and with some patches having higher suitability than others. And then consider meta populations of meta populations which are linked via reaction diffusion equations. Uh, this is something uh, uh, Robert Holt and my advisor Tim Kitt sort of proposed. Like you kind of like local you kind of handle local heterogeneity using meta populations, but then the global level, like at, at a very large spatial scales, you can link those meta population dynamics using reaction diffusion equations. That 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 would be one way to address that. Okay, um, there is another question from Jeanette in the chat, but I think to keep us on time for our final talk, um, I'll let you look at it there and we can move on. Thanks again for your talk. Welcome. Yes, thank you so much. Um, our, the final talk in this session, so just note that in the program, right, the, there's a, a V10, a virtual 10 talk at the end of this session. That one is um, 
is uh, for you to watch at your um, at your leisure. Uh, we won't be playing it during the session. So the final talk for our session is by Serena Kaplans. Um, and Serena is going to talk to us about uh, evolve and resequence for egg size in a sea slug with striking life history plasticity. Yeah, thank you all for being here. Um, let me just get myself set up a little bit. Um, it's really uh, a pleasure on my part to be here to present to you uh, work that I did for my dissertation. Um, it's also very nice to see a bunch of familiar faces, um, if not familiar names. Um, so this is work that I did for my dissertation, uh, which took place at UC Davis in the lab of Rick Grossberg. Uh, and I'm interested in the evolution of developmental mode. Um, so developmental mode for marine invertebrates, we can really consider it as a suite of traits that begins with this difference in egg size and often a very dramatic difference in egg size. Um, so we describe two different types of uh, development as being planktotropic. Those larvae usually come from very small eggs and there are many of them produced, um, so hundreds to thousands. And they have to spend a period of time in the plankton acquiring nutrients in order to go through that larval phase. Um, so they're feeding the plankton, they're planktotropic. And we counter that with uh, lecithotropic. So these are larvae that are provisioned with all of the nutrients that they need in the form of maternally deposited yolk. Um, so they don't have to feed in the um, water column. Some of them are actually incapable of feeding in the water column because they don't have the feeding structures necessary to, to feed. Um, so we have uh, primarily this trait really sort of starts with a difference in egg size. And then we also have um, larval determined traits. So settlement behavior, swimming behavior, larval morphology, that give us these two different um, developmental modes. And these developmental modes have uh, the potential to have a big impact on things like dispersal distance and gene flow, um, local adaptation, um, and even uh, rates of extinction and speciation. So we're really interested in how these developmental modes evolve. Um, and I study the evolution of developmental mode in Sacagloss and sea slugs because they show this great diversity of developmental modes. So in this phylogeny of around 300 species, um, this paper that came out now five years ago uh, found that um, the ancestral state is planktotrophy. And from that, lecithotrophy has evolved um, independently at least 27 times. Uh, in addition to that, um, sacaglass and sea slugs show more instances of posologony than any other species. Um, so posologonous species are those that are actually capable of producing both types of larvae. Um, so it's a case where you have interspecific variation for developmental mode within a species. It's usually a fixed polymorphism. So a single individual will make um, either large egg masses or many small ones. Um, and there's one case of plasticity. And so I'll be talking about that more for the rest of the talk on um, the species that I work on is this one species that is uh, plastic for um, being posologonous. So the idea with posologony is that it may be an intermediate um, in the evolution of lecithotrophy. You can imagine that if you're evolving from a planktotrophic ancestor towards lecithotrophy, at some point in time, you might be a species that can do both. Um, in addition, because we have this polymorphism united within a single species, we can do some really cool things in quantitative genetics to identify the genetic basis of um, developmental mode because we don't have these additional confounding species uh, differences that um, arise through species divergence. So it makes for a really good um, case study to look at the genetic basis of, of developmental mode. And that's been done, been done to the greatest extent in this polykey analid um, Streblospio benedicti. So this picture here on the left is showing um, a lecithotrophic developing um, a worm next to a planktotrophic developing uh, worm. And they're the same age. Um, they're just different because they came from different sized eggs and then they have a different developmental trajectory. Um, and so you can do crosses between uh, worms that lay either lecithotrophic or planktotrophic offspring, looking at the um, uh, uh, phenotype in the F2s. And then from that, this, um, uh, research group has described um, the linkage groups and the um, evolution of these different characteristics. So they found, um, namely in this study that was published in 2018, that um, larval size, so this maternally determined trait of offspring size, uh, seems to be uncoupled from larval determined traits of morphology. Um, and so that indicates that these traits, size, and morphology could actually evolve independently of each other. Um, in nature, you rarely find 
these intermediates, you typically find a population entirely consisting of lecithotrophic um, developing uh, worms versus another population will be planktotrophic. So it seems to be that there's some maintenance happening um, that prevents these sort of F2s um, from happening in nature. And it's possibly that it's this um, positive frequency dependence that homogenizes these populations. So uh, this is information that was existing around the time that I was putting together my dissertation. I was really interested in looking at this, um, not in annelids, but in sacagloss and sea slugs to see how they compare. Um, as far as the genetic architecture of developmental mode, is it many genes or a few genes? And also I was really interested in looking at how the environment plays a role um, to understand what selective factors are actually selecting for one developmental mode versus the other. Um, and so I do that in this species of sea slug called Elderia willowi. Uh, they can be found on the mudflats in estuaries along the coast of California. And they show this really striking seasonal variation in the type of offspring that they produce. So if you go out and collect slugs in the summer, um, you'll find most of them are making the cethotrophic offspring compared to if you go out in the winter, they've switched to now producing more planktotrophic offspring. Um, and there's still a lot of variation within and between populations. So I was interested in that whole picture. It looks like a good G by E interaction. Um, and so thinking about some of the environmental characteristics that um, take place along the coast in the summers versus the winters. Um, in the summer, of course, it's a lot hotter. It's much hotter in Southern California than in Northern California, typically. Um, also then in the winter, we have a change in that the temperature decreases, but we also have this influx in um, rainfall events that causes a reduction in salinity. So we're looking at, in some cases, a really dramatic change in salinity. Um, as well as a reduction in temperature. Uh, we have evidence for Algeria willowi that salinity seems to be a range limiting uh, factor that keeps them from going much further north than um, Bodega Bay. And we also have good evidence that there's local adaptation to salinity. So for my dissertation, I focused on the effect of salinity alone. Um, and so one of the first things that I did in my dissertation was to show that this is in fact a G by E interaction. So the phenotype, um, that variation that you're seeing in the phenotype is produced by an interaction between genes in the environment. Um, and I did this by raising slugs in a split brood design in low salinity that mimics the winter salinity that they experience and in high salinity that mimics the summer conditions they experience. And I found by and large, most families produce more um, lecithotrophic offspring in high salinity than in low salinity, but there's a lot of variation within and between uh, families. Um, secondarily, I found that I can select on this trait. So I can select for lecithotrophy and increase the proportion of lecithotrophy over generations in the lab. Um, and that suggests that there's standing genetic variation for this trait. So I was interested in building on those observations and asking, can I actually identify the genes that are associated with developmental mode in this plastic species? And then what happens to those genes when selection takes place in more than one environment? Um, if you're thinking about a plastic uh, trait, it's interacting with the environment as well as genetic variation. Um, are there different genetic variants that produce the phenotype of lecithotrophy in low salinity than in high salinity? And can I actually see a change in the frequency of those variants when I do selection? Um, so those are the main questions I seek to answer. And to answer them, I set up the selection experiment where I selected for lecithotrophy um, across five generations. And I um, had three replicates um, for each of my treatments, which were um, a high and a low salinity treatment to replicate again the experiences, the um, uh, mean uh, summer and winter um, environment that natural populations experience. Um, so these are the results of the phenotype for the selection experiment. Um, initially, I had quite a big difference in high versus low salinity. Um, uh, that's sort of the natural pattern that I, the standard pattern that I've seen when I raise slugs in the lab for just one generation. There's more lecithotrophic offspring produced in high salinity than in low, but that pattern went away quickly as selection proceeded. Um, and so I had a, a relatively steady increase in the phenotype I was selecting for as I continued to do selection. So for sequencing, um, I selected slugs prior to um, doing the selection experiment, and I sequenced them via rad seek, uh, rad tags, um, 191 individuals, which I phenotyped for whether they laid lecithotrophic or planktotrophic egg masses. So this is the result of doing a um, genome-wide association study. I found 10 loci associated with egg mass. Um, type across eight scaffolds. So this is really exciting. It looks like we have some candidates that seem to be associated with um, developmental mode in this species. 
And so moving on, I wanted to see what happens to those Ken candidate genes, um, the alleles for those Ken candidate uh, lo loci when I select on uh, lecithotropy. So again, I'm using RADSeq. Um, I sequence 96 slugs from high and low salinity, and I have um, sequenced individuals from all of those replicate populations. So looking at the results from um, just to see the change in allele frequency for those 10 candidate genes, um, by and large, things are changing in the same direction. So um, in this case, the low and high salinity treatments, they're both increasing in frequency. These are both decreasing in frequency, um, but we see generally a greater response in the low salinity treatments. And that's likely due to the fact that the um, coefficient of selection was greater in low salinity treatments because the slugs produce fewer lecithotrophic um, offspring in that first generation. And also there's a reduction in survival in low salinity. So it's probably just a, a greater selection pressure um, in the low salinity treatment. Um, and then three of these uh, were significant in, in their response. So I also then wanted to check and see if the change in allele frequency is in the direction that we would expect it to be going in. So I went back to that original um, data set where I did the GWAS and I looked at the slugs that were just producing the cetotrophic um, uh, offspring and I calculated the allele frequency for those 10 candidate genes and then looked to see um, doing the same thing for the planktotrophic slugs, looked to see what the change was um, from lecithotrophic versus from planktotrophic. So in this case, uh, this is just showing the data from the high salinity um, selection lines. We have less of a change from the L uh, lane slugs, so the lecithotrophic lane slugs, and we have a greater change from the slugs that were laying planktotrophic offspring. So it looks like things move from the allele frequency that found in planktotrophic lane slugs towards the lecithotrophic lane slugs, if that makes sense. Um, and I found the same response by and large in the low salinity treatments, uh, maybe a little bit more of a, a change um, from the lecithotrophic and planktotrophic uh, data sets there. Um, so it looks like there's not a huge difference uh, in the response to selection for these 10 candidate genes, um, depending on the environment. So um, they're going in the same direction in most cases. We found a, a stronger response in low, selection, low salinity, um, but by and large, it looks like once you actually produce this lecithotrophic uh, phenotype, what ends up responding to selection are a similar subset of genes. Um, I'll be delving into this in more depth by applying these linked selection analyses um, that were developed at UC Davis by Vince Buffalo and Graham Coop um, to my data set. And that will allow me to actually tease apart um, more than just these 10 candidate genes. So I can actually find at a larger scale across the genome how many um, uh, uh, loci were actually responding to selection in high versus low salinity, um, and then actually separate out the response to selection versus the um, effects of drift. So that'll give me a lot of power to um, get a better sense of what was going on in the entire data, data set beyond the 10 candidate genes. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank everybody who has supported me um, along the way while I was doing my dissertation work. Um, I'm currently doing a postdoc in the Williams lab and the Bay lab, and I'm still working on these slugs. So I'm happy to um, answer any questions if anybody has any about um, my current work or, or about the work that I've presented to you today. So thank you very much. Great, thanks very much, Serena. So as usual, um, please drop some questions in the chat for Serena. Uh, anyone? <laughs> I guess I went through that really fast. <laughs> <laughs> you can like rest for a breath if you want. Yeah, you can take a minute. <laughs> Maybe I'll just ask a question verbally since whatever um, <laughs> moderator's license, I guess. Um, uh, I'm wondering how for, I'm. I'm a plant evolutionary biologist, and I'm I'm quite struck by the apparent lability of what I think of as pretty fundamental life history strategies, and uh, that's not really a question, but <laughs> to put a question mark at the end of it, I guess I'm ask, what I'm asking is how common is this kind of um, lability in traits that we tend to think of as being fairly constrained on, on a macroevolutionary scale? 
Yeah, no, that's, I mean, I think that's a, a good question. Um, as far as we know, this is the only species that's been described to be plastic mm -hmm. for making both types of egg masses. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it appears to be primarily a family level plasticity. So you can see it when you raise um, families in split brood designs, um, but there's also individual um, lability. So a slug can change the type of egg mass that it makes during its lifespan, uh, but it's not very well understood how it does that or how often it does that, or if every slug can do that. Um, in my early work for my dissertation, I raised slugs in individual uh, containers and I think around 70% of them always laid the same type of egg mass, but that 30% could, could change. They could make, you know, planktotrophic eggs and then let's eat the trophic or vice versa. Um, so it seems like there, there is some flexibility um, and it just depends on, on the environmental conditions. And, and it seems like it's, it's likely a vet hedging strategy. Um, their environment is highly ephemeral. And so it seems like it's, it's just a good way to make, you know, good use of a good environment, make those eight babies that can develop very quickly um, and make use of, you know, good algae. And when that algae might disappear in a minute, you know, you can have the planktotrophic ones hanging out and looking for, for a good habitat. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's some questions coming in. I will maybe skip to Vince's since Nick says he thinks his question was answered, but um, any changes across the age of individuals? Um, so yeah, as they get older, do they tend to lay larger or smaller eggs or yeah. is it? Um, I don't, so I don't think a slug lives very long um, in, in natural populations, you know, maybe a few weeks to a few months. It really depends on oh, how wow. their habitat is. Um, but what I have observed in the lab is that they tend to lay planktotrophic eggs initially. So they're laying smaller eggs first. And then at some point in time, if they're going to lay lysithotrophic eggs, they'll start laying them. Uh, it's not directly related to their size. So if you get um, you know, adult slugs in the lab laying eggs, there's no relationship between body size and egg type. Um, but it does seem like there might be some, some age relationship um, in that the younger ones might stay, sort of make like a test egg mass that's planktotrophic and and then they'll settle into whatever they're going to do for, for the rest of the time that they're around. Yeah, I'm, I'm just really intrigued about like how they make these decisions if they're deciding. I don't know what a sea slug uh, does, but um, yeah, like there seems to be benefits of having both options and having one and the other, but with the environment being so variable, like what what is determining what they choose? Yeah, I've, I've tried to get a handle at that, um, doing uh, individual level experiments and like changing their environment. And um, I could not get them to switch. So I can get a, I can get a strong response when I just raise the, them, you know, from the juvenile stage in different environments. Um, but I have a hard time getting the adult once it's in an environment to continue to lay egg masses and actually respond in a way that you might predict from what they do in nature. So, um, so I don't know, it might be that they're responding to multiple cues and you have to mess with all of those cues in order to actually get them to change. Um, or it's that it is important at a certain life stage, like what they're experiencing in the juvenile stage is what determines what they're really going to do as an adult. I hope you can't hear my baby crying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a little bit, but that's okay. <laughs> we'll just call that cheering. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, if there are no more questions, then what's left is to thank all the speakers from this session and especially to thank my teammates, uh, Nick and Chelsea for helping to run such a smooth, uh, such a smooth session. The great thing about the SLMR meeting, if, if you haven't been in person, was perfectly reflected in today's um, set of talks and uh, the, the sort of intriguing natural history that we still, that we still need to explain and incorporate into our into our theoretical models about how the world works. And I find that this is the, you know, one of my favorite meetings in terms of spanning from ecology through evolution and from motivated ground up through motivated um, through, through theoretical questions all the way down. And, and that was um, really well exemplified today. So it looks like we all have just about an hour. If you're on the East Coast, time to get into those jammies and uh, find your Snuggie, dig it out from the cupboard and get ready for Scott Edwards' talk. And uh, for those of us on this coast, uh, maybe a little time for a bite to eat um, before that. Uh, and uh, uh, hopefully um, we will see you around 
the pond uh, tomorrow. So take care, everyone. Have a good evening.